Uh, committee members, members of the public, my intention is to hold items 2, 3, 4, 8, 10, 12, 15, and 17. And uh, unless uh, members wish to take them off, I'd like to propose putting on consent items 1, 5, 6, 7, 9, 11, 13, 14, 16, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, and 25. Uh, to offer those items for consent, but of course, any member wishing to pull one out, uh, one of those items off, is, or any of, any number of those items off, is, is always welcome. And uh, before we go to public comment, I want to include an amendment on six, just to telegraph that. Um, and can we read that amendment into the record? If not, we can we can come back to that. Um, we don't have to read them in advance. So, let's move to public comment to, to get rolling here. Uh, we're going to move public comment. Uh, if you any instructions for public comment to read into the record? No instructions, sir. Okay. So, folks, speakers will have a total of two minutes, one minute for a specific item, uh, and then if they wish, they can have an additional minute for uh, general public comment. Actually, usually it's one minute. Or Two minutes for the items and an additional minute for general public comment. Okay, uh, folks who have signed up, we have uh, Goat Puppet followed by some pejoratives, Arnold Sachs, Jose, okay, Raymond Chen. Uh, okay, there's a bunch of false names on here that people have put on. Uh, I'm not going to read the false names. I'll, at the end, if somebody uh, doesn't have, didn't get called, they can come up. Uh, Alejandro Rodriguez, Ana Cruz, Ana Juarez, Claudia Moreno, Dulce Vac, uh, Vasquez, Elena Gonzalez. I just read a whole bunch of names. If your name has been called, you can go to the, the uh, house stage left, stage right, house left side of the room and line up and then we'll have speakers and I'd ask for the uh, first speaker to come to the mic and the, the next speaker to sort of uh, go on the on deck circle which is, is sitting right by the mic so that we can move quickly. So to have one person at the mic and the next person sitting as close to them as they can so that they're ready to speak as soon as the first person is, is completed. Uh, welcome. If you could state your name uh, and the items that you wish to speak on. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Claudia Moreno. Uh, miembros de este comité. Good afternoon. My name is Claudia Moreno. Members of the committee. Uh, quisiera, por favor, pedirles que nos ayuden a reducir el costo del permiso. I would ask you to please help us reduce the costs of the permit. De 540 a 2751. From 540 to ¿Lo puedes repetir cuánto? De 2750 a de 540 a 2751. To 2755. Ah, uh, necesitamos que nos apoyen ya que la economía de este año ha estado muy mal para mi negocio. We need your support because the uh, finances for our business has been really, really bad. La inflación ha sido un gran problema después de la pandemia. Inflation after pandemic has been a big problem. Necesitamos ese dinero para poder llevar comida a nuestros hogares. So we need that money to bring food to our homes. También hablo por mis compañeros vendedores de alimentos. I am also speaking on behalf of my companions, the ones that sell um, food. Ya que ellos necesitan más permisos para poder salir a vender a las aceras. They need more permits in order to go and sell uh, at the sidewalks. Y eso va a poder ayudar para que ellos sigan uh, renovando sus permisos. And that will help so they can continue to renew their permits. Ya que yo misma se me vence en abril y no podría pagarlos porque ahorita el año ha comenzado muy mal. Even myself, my permit is going to be expired in April, and I wouldn't be able to pay it because the year didn't have a good start. Y yo quiero seguir con mi pequeño negocio. And I really want to continue with my small business. Yo soy una vendedora de fashion district. I am a salesperson in the fashion district. El cual hemos tenido muchos problemas, incendios el año pasado, que no han llegado a vender, a llegar a los clientes a nuestras áreas. 
And we've had so many problems, including some fires that prevent clients to come to our area and to our business. Les pido su liderazgo para que nos puedan apoyar. Gracias. So I request you please support through your leadership. Gracias. Next speaker, and, and again, if the, the, the next speaker could go move in and be in the on deck circle very close so that we can have minimize the time in between speakers so the next speaker could come sit. Mr. Sachs, go ahead. Which item or items would you like to speak in? Um, public comment. Item number two, item number three, item number six. Okay, so you'll have two minutes for the items and one minute for, for public comment related to this committee. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. First of all, on all these items except the last bunch that uh, deal with court cases, there is no community impact on any of these items, which is fucked up. Um, I just read that the city is facing a similar uh, problem they had in 2007 when they were almost ready to declare bankruptcy and they had to lay off 5,000 DWP workers and the unions went ballistic because they had to do some juggling with the city workers because this DWP union has the best benefits in the city. Only, only, company, only place they have better benefits is that Metropolitan Transportation Author Association. So that's a real problem because I just read about that. The state of California is facing a $68 billion budget. The governor is looking to cut, make cuts. So that's a real problem because um, they had to transfer people around. Item number two, we need more equality again. Stop this equity stuff already. You have a problem with immigration. You have people coming up, they're, they're backed up at the border State of California is supposed to be a sanctuary state. What are you going to do when people start showing up here? Number three, you left out LA Arena Land Company. In 2008, there was supposed to be a stadium built over there at Staples Center, but that stadium was never built. They had, a, they had meetings right here in city council. As a matter of fact, um, AEG, Tim Lewecki, reeled in a 20,000 page sequel report, and they had a special meeting and it was, it, was, it was never built. As a matter of fact, one of the supervisors was, was blackmailed. And then we have this, this money for LAPD. I don't know why you don't get money for LAFD so they can do asbestos work and they can get money to help for the fire department. Thank, thank you, you thank for you, your time and attention. Absolutely, thank you, Mr. Sachs. Mr. Spindler, go ahead. What item or items would you like to speak on, Mr. Spindler? Yeah, it's all the goddamn fucking items and general fucking comment. <laughs> okay, two minutes for the items. Yeah, so I believe Arnold had another minute of general and yeah, he didn't let him speak. <laughs> so let's see here. Look at all these goddamn settlements. Shame on Marchese for allowing all of this stuff here. Look at this. It's all Marchese Harris's fault. <laughs> We got number eight, fuck number eight, animal shelters, fuck them. Number nine, fuck number nine. <laughs> yes. So we have some more money we're giving away. And the big thing here is that none of the other committee members understand or pay attention, except for the black one. Let's give him a hand. Hey, well done. <laughs> yes, that's right, because he understands without money, there ain't no honey. <laughs> Josephina Juarez, yes, I support number 11. Kristen Harari versus the Skating Edge. Yeah, she was injured horribly. We support it. Number 12, Stacey Vince. Yes, we support it. Pay her. The LAPD fucked up on number 13. Thoroughly support that. <laughs> and if all the lawyers are here, please remember, keep suing the shit out of this no-good corrupt city. You're doing a wonderful job. <laughs> And then we got other ones here. There's so many goddamn settlements. Yes, sir. Yeah, Pat McCosker, he's checking his email to see what's for dinner. <laughs> you're you're going to be having chicken stew again tonight because you're late. <laughs> and then we have the number three tourism travel convention center expansion. Fuck the convention center. <laughs> Tear it down. Put up a goddamn new stadium, a new football stadium. 
Then after they go to prison over in Inglewood, they'll be fleeing here back to Los Angeles. <laughs> what a good idea. That's right. <laughs> and then we will fuck the other items. Now we get to our general public comment. <laughs> so Friday morning, join us as Jose Luis Weezar, the former councilman pimp, controller of Plum, now chaired by Marchese, decides if he gets nine years or 13 years in federal prison. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna flip a coin, everybody. The FBI, are you standing by? Okay, call it heads, tails. Oh, shit. He's gonna get 13 fucking years? Oh, no, no. He, why is he gonna do 13 years? So all of you can steal? Are any of you going to bother? What about his two kids, the one with the disability? What about his brother, who's a convicted felon? What about his wife, who has a bar card and was cashing $9,000 checks into her account? Look at them, people. Look, they're pretending like they're not listening. But Jose Weizar would like to say, I'm sure, fuck all of you. <laughs> Okay, next speaker. And if we could get the, the feet speaker following the speaker to, to get prepared. Buenas tardes a, a todos y cada uno de los miembros aquí presentes. Okay, so you like one, one minute on that item. Go ahead. Good afternoon to all the members here present. Uh, mi nombre es Dulce Vázquez. Soy vendedora ambulante de comida en el área de San Fernando, en el Valle de San Fernando, en Panorama City. Yeah, my name is Dulce Vasque and I am um, ambulatory like sales of uh, uh, food sales in Panorama City and in the Valley, San Fernando Valley. He, he estado vendiendo los últimos 11 años de mi vida ahí comida y en esta tarde vengo aquí para para hacer bueno no para hacerles saber ya he sabido que necesitamos que por favor nos que nos aprueben. Um, El costo del permiso que es, es de 27.51. Um, so, uh, I've been selling for 11 years and uh, food, and I'm here this afternoon to please let you know. I know that you already know, but we do need that uh, you approve the price of the permit. It should be 27.51. Ah, como todos sabemos, después de la pandemia, toda nuestra situación económica ha afectado en diversas áreas a, a cada uno de nosotros. As we all know, after pandemic, all our economic uh, situation has been very affected to all of us and in all aspects of our life. La canasta básica ha incrementado, creo, un 300% y estamos a punto de que nos aumenten nuevamente las rentas. Um, so the basic basket it has an increase of a 300%, around 300%, and we are close to really have another increase on our rents. No soy estadista, pero me doy cuenta cuando termino de, de hacer mi venta y voy a la marqueta y veo todo lo que ha incrementado, que antes compraba con 100 dólares, ahora necesito 300 dólares para poder comprar las mismas cantidades. So I, I'm not a statistic person, but it's very easy to see that after doing my sales, I go to the market and I see that all the prices went up. Whatever I used to buy all this stuff for $100, and now I have to buy, it, it cost me like $300, so all the prices are going up. Nosotros uh, estamos pidiendo para que nos apoyen. Porque nosotros solamente venimos a este país para salir adelante. Tenemos familias, tenemos hijos a quienes salir, a, a quienes sacar adelante. Y um, cada vez se nos hace más difícil. So we are here asking support because we, we come to this country to, to be able to have a better life. And we have family and we have children and we want them to have a better life. So it's, things are getting it every day more difficult. No somos una oh, carga thank, pública, thank ya que también nosotros... Oh, sorry, your time has expired. Thank you. Next, next speaker. Let me get the next speaker uh, in the ready position, please. Buenas tardes, miembro del comité. Mi nombre es Hermenegilda García y quiero hacer un comentario público y un comentario en el punto número dos de la agenda del día de hoy. Soy so, vendedora uh, ambulante. Uh, si me da un segundito para traducirse, buena... Um, good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Emanuele Hilda Garcia, and I want to talk about the 
Article number two, and a, pub, a general public comment. Soy vendedora ambulante por, por 27 años aquí en el área de Los Ángeles. Uh, señores concejales del este del comité, les hago el llamado para apoyarme a mí y a mis compañeros del área en la propuesta del reducir el costo del permiso de la acera en 27 con 51 centavos. Ok, me deja traducir la señora, por favor. So, I am a salesperson on the streets for 27 years here in Los Angeles. So I'm especially like talking to all the committee on the east side of these streets. If you could please help me and help here, help all my, my friends here. We really need to, uh, the price of the permit to be 27.51. En mi experiencia en el reducir el costo del permiso me ayudará a asegurar los alimentos de mis hijos y poder pagar en mi renta, ya que el próximo mes pagaremos el aumento y hoy en día el costo de alimentos es muy alto esto lo hace muy difícil um, so in, in my experience if you would be able to help reduce the price this would help me to buy food for my children also to pay the rent because next month we will already be paying with an uh, increase uh, it is already really high so th this is making things very difficult sin dudas, acceso al permiso de bajo costo de la ciudad me ayudaría a apoyar mi negocio y a mi familia y evitar ser víctima de la criminalización y confiscación de la ciudad porque tendría un permiso clave para vender en las aceras. Okay, so uh, without a doubt, the, to have um, this price of the permit of low cost, it would help my business, my family business, and also Uh, wouldn't be criminalized or confiscated our products when we are selling on the sidewalks. Pido de favor que, re, que re, hagan de reducción el costo a 27 con 51 centavos. Muchas gracias. Buenas tardes. So I really ask Great. you that please uh, reduce the cost to 27 with 51 cents. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And the next person get in the ready position. Go ahead. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Elena González. Good afternoon, my name is Elena González. Este, y quiero dar un comentario público. And I want to give a public comment. Señores concejales de este comité, le hago un llamado a todos y que nos apoyen en esto, en esta reducción del permiso. So, to all the members of this committee, I am calling out to please support this um, re reduction on the permit. Ya que como todos lo sabemos y todos vemos que ahorita todo ya subió. As we all know, all the prices went up already. Y como dicen mis demás compañeros, el próximo mes sube la renta y para nosotros cada día es más difícil. And as you've heard all my other companions, the rent is also rising next month and it, things are getting really difficult for all of us. Por favor, quiero que po se pongan a pensar en todos los gastos que nosotros tenemos, pagamos renta, muchos biles, y eso para nosotros es muy complicado. So please, I want you to think about all the expenses that we have. We have to pay the rent, and we have to pay all, all our bills, and this is very complicated for all of us. Ya que en mi caso personal, yo soy madre soltera, no recibo ayuda de nadie más que de mi, de mi trabajo vendiendo en la calle. So in my case, for example, I am a single mother and, um, and I, nobody helps me, only my own work on the streets. Yo no, yo no me considero una carga pública, hago mis taxes, eh, trato de hacer todo legal. I do not consider myself as a public burden because I do pay my taxes, I do everything that I had to do legally. Great. Muchas gracias, thank you. Next speaker. Next Buenas person, tardes, concejales. Mi nombre es Alejandra Rodríguez. Soy vendedora del área de Hollywood en el Paseo de la Fama. Estoy aquí. Eh, el momento, porque no, no, le, no le escuché. ¿Puede repetir, por favor? Soy vendedora del área de I'm Hollywood. A suite of the area of Hollywood. Mi nombre es Alejandra Rodríguez. My name is Alejandra Rodríguez. Señores concejales de este comité, les hago un llamado para apoyarme a mí y a mis compañeros. Members of the committee, I call on, on you to support me and my colleagues. 
en la propuesta de reducir el costo del permiso del, de la acera. In the proposal to, redu to reduce the sidewalk permit. A 27.51. To 27.51. A todos los vendedores de alimentos les ayudará a poder ahorrar para los costos de los requisitos de salubridad, por ejemplo, de comisaria. To all the food uh, street sellers, it will help them to save for the cost of health requirements, uh, for instance, the comisaria. Ahorita todo está muy caro, eso es lo que pedimos nada más que nos apoyen para reducir el permiso de la acera. Gracias. Right now everything is very expensive, so the only thing we are asking you is to uh, help us to reduce the sidewalk, sidewalk permit. Thank you. Aquí en esta área ahorita hay más de 50 compañeros vendedores ambulantes y queremos que nos apoyen. Right now there are about 50 fellow street vendors and I, we want you to support us. Thank you. Thank you. Muchas gracias. I'm going to read some additional names as the next speaker comes up. Uh, Ana Cruz, Ana Juarez, Elena Gonzalez, Erica Ruiz, uh, Eliuala Chavez, Elio Gil Mendez, Fernando Quezada, Javier Sanchez, Lydia Catalan, Margarito Mendez, Mariana Men uh, Martinez, uh, Miguel Mejia, Miguel Perez. If you've heard your name, feel free to come up and line up. Go ahead. The floor is yours. Good afternoon. My name is Ana Cruz, and I am an organizer with Community Power Collective. I would like to speak on item number two on today's agenda. Today, we ask you to support the motion on the vending permit cost to support thousands of families that depend on street vending in Los Angeles. The possible permit cost of $27.51 will provide support for food vendors to legalize their businesses since they are required to have a food car approved by the Department of Public Health and they have to pay for their health permits to be able to operate. Being able to legalize a food car is an investment that it can be more than $10,000 for all the costs. Vendors need the support to be able to legalize their businesses and not suffer from harass harassment or fines for not having their proper permits. Um, today, more than 50 vendors are here asking um, you for the support for this um, motion. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. We'll get the next speaker to get in the ready position. Go ahead, Beth. Buenas tardes, miembros del comité. Good Mi nombre es Lidia. Of the My name is Lidia. Quiero hacer un comentario público del punto número dos de la agenda del día de hoy. I would like to make a comment on point number two of the agenda. Soy vendedor ambulante por más de diez años. I am a street vendor for more than ten years. Vendo en el distrito número nueve. I sell in district number nine. Hago un llamado para que apoyen. I call upon you for, uh, for, uh, for your support. A mí y a todos los vendedores ambulantes. Your support to me, for me and for all, my, uh, for all the street vendors. En la propuesta de reducir el costo del permiso de acera. In the proposal to reduce the cost permit. Que quede a 27.51 centavos. So that it stays in 27 and 50. 26 and 51 cents. Se está sufriendo un gran impacto en las ventas. We are suffering a great deal of impact on sales. Ya que están reduciendo, se está reduciendo un 50% notablemente. Because they are, they are being reduced by about 50% and in a noticeable way. Deben de ser más considerados. You should be more considerate. Los Ángeles ha puesto un precio muy elevado en los permisos. The Los Angeles has established a very high price uh, on the permits. En San Diego el costo del permiso es de solo 38 dólares. In San Diego the cost of the permit is only 38 dollars. El costo de vida de la el costo de vida, el costo de la canasta básica es muy elevada en la actualidad. The cost of living and the cost of the basic needs right now it's uh, is very uh, very high. Hay madres solteras que de su venta sacan adelante a su familia. There are single mothers who uh, depend from their sales to, uh, get, a, to get ahead with their, their families. Muchos vendedores ambulantes no califican para beneficios sociales. Many street sell, uh, vendors do not qualify for, uh, to receive social benefits. Great, Th thank you. That's, that's your time. Gracias. Appreciate ya it. Su tiempo, lo aprecio. Ne next speaker, please. 
We have, a, we have a lot of speakers, so we're trying to move quickly, and we appreciate what everyone is saying. Thank you. Uh, buenas tardes, miembros del comité. Good afternoon, members of the committee. Mi nombre es Javier Sánchez. My name is Javier Sánchez. Y soy un vendedor por más de cinco años. And I have been a street uh, vendor for more than five years. Y vengo a hacer comentario público y hablar sobre el punto número dos. I'm here to make a public comment and speak on point number two. Uh, uh, nosotros como vendedores eh, de, de la calle, nosotros tenemos que sacar un permiso de, del State Board. As a street vendors, we have to get a permit from the State Board. Tenemos que sacar otro permiso de la ciudad. And another one for the city. Y sacar un permiso como vendedor de la calle. And to get a permit as street vendor. Y el permiso de la calle eh, del, del condado de Los Ángeles es el más caro en el estado de California. And the permit of the county of Los Angeles is, is, is a more expensive in the in California. Y como y como negocio chico o vendedor de la de las calles. As a street vendor and a small business uh, nosotros, vendor. Nosotros no no podemos comprar cantidades grandes en en, en las tiendas de mayoreo. We cannot uh, uh, make um, um, uh, we cannot get a lot of um, things from the wholesale stores. Entonces nosotros tenemos que comprar en tiendas regulares donde llegamos a pagar taxes. So we have to get uh, to buy our things on regular stores where we have to pay taxes. Y de ahí tenemos que hacer los taxes de venta, que and volvemos from, a pagar taxes. And from then we have to again pay taxes for selling. Entonces eso nos hace hace que algunos de nosotros no podemos sacar el permiso de venta de la calle. That does make make for some of us that we are unable to get the permit uh, for the street vendor. Porque es es muy caro, entonces Because le pedimos a los señores concejales. It's very expensive, so what we are asking the uh, council members. O a este comité que nos lo reduzcan a 27.51 centavos. And to this committee to reduce it to 27.51 cents. Para poder seguir este viviendo en, ahora sí que en la ciudad de Los Ángeles, so, que ahora es muy caro. So we are able uh, to uh, live in the city of Los Angeles, which is right now is very expensive. Y que a partir del mes que viene vamos a pagar el 4% de renta más alto. Uh, from the next month we're going to be paying 4% a higher rent. So le pido por mis compañeros y yo que los señores concejales este, voten para esta moción que nos reduzcan el precio del, del permiso de vender en la calle. On my colleagues, I, I ask the council members to reduce the price It's for the, the street vendor permit. Gracias. Thank, Thank you. you. Next speaker, please. Muy buenas tardes, señores del comité. Mi nombre es members Erika. Members of the committee, my name is Erika. Y vengo aquí a hacer un comentario público del punto comment número dos. On point number two. Como experiencia como vendedor ambulante ha sido muy difícil. My experience as a street vendor has been very difficult. Y al saber que que si ustedes nos apoyan a que tengamos el costo de 27 con 50 centavos. And to know that you are supporting us so that we can get the cost of 27.51 cents. Nos ayudarían mucho en nuestra economía. You would help us a lot in our, uh, for our economy. Ya que la venta, pues, lastimosamente. Sadly, our sales. Ha sido muy bajo. Has been uh, very low. Lo cual ha sido que nuestra canasta básica sea muy deteriorada. Which has deteriorated our um, basic uh, basket needs. Y a nuestras familias que son las que más, um, pues no podemos darles lo necesario para que ellos puedan tener una vida libre. And we're not able to give our family the necessary things so that they could have a free life. Les pedimos que tomen en consideración. We ask you to please consider. El costo de 27.50. The cost of 27 and 50. Y que vean por nosotros. And that you please take care of us. Y por cada uno de nuestros compañeros que cada uno sufrimos. And for each one of us, we are suffering, each one of us. Cada, cada costo que nos está subiendo. Each time that, uh, that we have to pay more for the cost. Les agradecemos. Um, we thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Buenas tardes. Miembros del comité y supervisores de las calles. Good afternoon, Mi members of the Eblogio committee Mendes. and street vendors. Y quiero hacer un comentario My name is público. Mendes, and I would like to make a public comment. Soy un vendedor de comida 
del Valle de San Fernando. I am a food vendor of, uh, from the San Fernando Valley. Y estoy aquí para pedirles que nos reduzcan el costo del permiso de 541 a 27.51. I'm here to ask you to reduce the cost of the permit from 541 to 27.51. Ya que después de la pandemia because Todo after ha aumentado the, la canasta básica. After the pandemic, uh, all the, the, all, everything has increased in the basic, basic basket. Y también está a punto de montar la renta. And then also the, the rent is about to uh, get higher. Entonces, si antes invertí 200 dólares, hoy tengo que invertir 200 dólares más. If before I, I, I would invest 20, 200 dólares, today I would have to invest more than uh, 200 dólares, more. Por eso les pido that is why I request que nos reduzcan el costo del permiso para poder seguir trabajando to y the, llevar el alimento a la casa. To reduce the cost of permit so we can continue working and bring food to our homes. Es todo, gracias. That's it, thank you. Thank you, next speaker. Go ahead. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Miembros del comité. Members Mi nombre of the es Margarito Méndez. My name is Margarito Méndez. Soy vendedor ambulante por más de 11 años en Panorama City y en el Valle de San Fernando. I have been a street vendor for uh, more than 11 years in the San Fernando Valley and Panorama City. Hoy es el día de hacer historia, que today, ustedes hagan historia a favor de las familias. Today is the day that you can make uh, history in favor of families. No solo somos nosotros los que estamos acá, vendedores ambulantes, atrás de nosotros hay familias, it hay only, niños y niñas. It's not only us, but behind us there are families, there are boys and girls. Nuestra vida es como la carrera de un maratón. Our life is like a marathon race. No todos tenemos la condición de ser primer lugar. Not all of us have the condition to get on the first place. Todos tenemos diferentes capacidades físicas. All of us, we have different physical capacities, abilities. Así también financieras. And financial. Hoy es el día que tomen conciencia y vean por las familias. Today is the day that you can um, be conscious and take care of families. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker. Buenas tardes, miembros del comité. Uh, good Mi nombre es Miguel Mejía. My name is Miguel Mejía. Y quiero hacer un comentario público en el punto número dos. And I would like to make a public comment on point number two. Uh, señores concejales de este comité. Uh, council members. Les hago un llamado para apoyarme a mí y a mis compañeros. I call on you to support me and my colleagues. En la propuesta de reducir el costo del permiso de acera. A 27, in the proposal to reduce the cost of sidewalk permit to uh, 2751. Ya que las ventas están muy bajas. Because our, our sales have been very low. Y por favor, señores concejales, apóyanos y muchas gracias. Uh, Council member, please support us and thank you very much. Next speaker. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Mariana Martínez. Good afternoon, my name is Mariana Martínez. Quiero hacer un comentario público del número dos. I would like to make a public comment on point number two. Soy, un vendedor, soy una vendedora ambulante por más de seis años. I have been a street vendor for more than six de years. De Panorama City, del in, distrito seis. In Panorama City, this district number six. Señores concejales de este comité, les hago un llamado para que nos apoyen a reducir. Council members of this committee, I, I call on you to support us in reducing El costo del permiso a 27.51. In reducing the cost of the permit to 2751. Ya que mis compañeros lo, lo han dicho ahorita después de la pandemia. My colleagues have already mentioned it, but after the pandemic. Han bajado las ventas. Sales have been reduced. Han subido la economía, las uh, rentas. And the costs have been had higher, and especially the rents. Y les pedimos que nos apoyen. And we are asking you to support us. Y nos ayudarían mucho apoyando esta moción. You would help us a lot by supporting this motion. Tenemos personas de la tercera edad, madres solteras. We have uh, senior citizens and single mothers. Que necesitamos trabajar. That we need to work for. Les pedimos que nos apoyen, we señores are, concejales. Council members, we are asking you to support us. Gracias. Thank you. Next speaker.
Buenas tardes, señores del comité. Good afternoon, committee Mi members. Mi nombre es Miguel Pérez. My name is Miguel Pérez. Soy organizador de vendedores ambulantes con colectivo Poder Comunitario. I am organizer of um, street vendors with a community, collective community. Señores del Comité de Finanza. Um, ladies and gentlemen from the Finance Committee. Estoy aquí en apoyo a todos los vendedores ambulantes. I am here to support all the street vendors. A que se les reduzca el costo del permiso a 27 dólares. To reduce the cost of the permit to 27 dollars. Porque para mí, because for me, el cobro de 541 o 291 dólares. To try to, to charge 541 or 291 dólares. Es como que el BCS estuviera cobrando piso a cada vendedor. It's as if you were uh, charging the floor, the piece of land for each vendor. Como una pandilla más en Los Ángeles. Like one more gang in, the, in Los Ángeles. ¿Y qué ofrecen por cobrarles 200 dólares? And what do they offer for charging 200 dollars? Nada. Nothing. No dan eh, talleres educativos. They don't offer any workshops for education. Con esos 291 tampoco dan seguridad. With those 291, they don't even offer any security. Por eso les pido that's what a I, ustedes. That's what I ask you que reduzcan el costo del permiso de 291 dólares okay. a 27 dólares. Gracias. Gracias, señor. Muchas gracias. gracias. Next speaker, please. Uh, I'm going to read a few more names. Uh, Ilya Chavez, Julio Mendez, Fernando Quezada, Javier Sanchez, uh, Rochel Galista. Gilis, uh, Buenas tardes. Go ahead. Good afternoon. Mi nombre es Rocael Jalista. My name is Rocael Jalista. Yo tengo 18 años vendiendo en las calles de Los Ángeles. And I have 18 years selling in the streets of Los Angeles. Y nunca he visto tanto en el alza de los permisos, el precio para los vendedores hasta ahora que empezó la pandemia. And I've never seen something like that, like the increasing of the prices on the permits for the vendors since the pandemic started. Ya todo está dicho por los demás compañeros que han pasado por aquí y quiero recalcar que si pueden ponerse la mano en la conciencia un poco a todos los profesionales del concilio para so, que este permiso sea rebajado. Um, so there's this, um, everything has been said by my colleagues here, so I just need to emphasize that if you can put your heart in your consciousness so you can really um, reduce the cost of the permit. A 27.50 y un centavo si lo pusieran, muchas familias podríamos beneficiarnos más, tener más dinero para solventar los problemas de la casa de nuestros hijos uh, y poderlos. So, okay. so uh, this, if you would reduce uh, the price to 27.50 and one cent, then many families would benefit to have uh, more money to solve some other problems that we have at our homes and our children. Algunos tenemos que agarrar algún part-time, un trabajito por allí para asegurarnos. So some of us, we even had to go get a part-time job or some other gig to be able to survive. Okay. Th thank you, Senor. Your time has expired. Se le acabó el señor. El señor ya no tiene más tiempo. Okay. So Thank you. Uh, next speaker, I'm going to read a few more names. Uh, Victoria Alvaranga, Adam Burke, Alicia Rivers, Eddie Alvarez, uh, Isabella Rojas, and Nella Bacasco. And I have read all the names, so if your name has been called, uh, please line up. Please, the floor is yours. Buenas tardes, señores del comité. Good afternoon, members of the committee. Mi nombre es Eulalia Chávez. My name is Eulalia Chávez. Quiero hacer comentarios sobre el punto número dos de la agenda del día de hoy. 
I want to make a comment about Article Number Two from today's agenda. Soy vendedora ambulante del Distrito 1 por 16 años, aquí en Los Ángeles, vendiendo tamales y atoles para sostén de mi familia. So I am a street vendor for 17, 16 years on District Number 1, and I sell tamales and atoles to support my family. Hoy estoy aquí, les hago un llamado a los comités de hoy. And I am here to call on the committee from today. Para apoyarnos en la propuesta de reducir el costo del permiso de la acera a 27.51. So I am here to, to ask you to please reduce the cost of the permit to sell on the sidewalks for 27.51. A todos los vendedores de alimento, ya que no, no solo un permiso nos toca pagar, si nos toca pagar varios permisos. For, for all the food vendors, it's not only one permit that we need to pay, it's more than one, there are other, other permits we have to pay for. Y hoy en día el tiempo ha cambiado. And today times have changed. El 80, 85% de mujeres que encabezan el hogar. About 80 or 85% of women that are the, the family holders. Por medio de la venta y el costo Tiene que reflejar un cálculo justo de ingreso anual que evita pagar un costo muy costoso. So this uh, proportion between the cost and um, the, the it should reflect like a fair amount, the, not something that is like very costly. Great. Thank you. Your time has oh, oh. expired. Thank you very much. Tiempo. Muchas gracias, señora. Next speaker, please. Buenas tardes, señores del comité. Good afternoon, members of the committee. Mi nombre es Fernando Quesada. My name is Fernando Quesada. Voy a, a dar un comentario público. I'm going to give a public comment. Y hablar en el punto número dos. And I want to talk about um, point number two, the article two. Soy vendedor ambulante por más de 20 años en la ciudad de Los Ángeles. I am a street vendor for over 20 years in the city of Los Angeles. Exactamente en la Vermont y la Melrose. Exactly, at Vermont and Melrose. Hemos estado luchando por años. And we've been struggling for many years. Por eso les pido que reduzcan el precio. That's why I ask you please reduce the price, the cost. De 541. From 541. A 27.51 centavos. To 27.51 cents. Creo que ustedes ven las noticias siempre, a diario. I think that you can see the news every day, daily. No es fácil estar vendiendo en las aceras. It is not easy to be selling on the streets. Por la delincuencia que se ha incrementado en la ciudad de Los Ángeles. Because there is so much crime in the city of Los Angeles. En los últimos dos meses. And in the last two months. ¿Cuántos vendedores hemos sido asaltados? How many vendors have been robbed? Y no hemos tenido la protección de nadie. And we don't have any protection from no one. Entonces, si pagamos mucho dinero so if we pay a lot of money por un permiso, for a permit, estamos pagando para que los vayan a saltar también ahí mismo. We are paying so they can even come and rob us right there. Les pido favor que reduzcan el precio a 27.51. So please reduce the price to 27.51 cents. Thank you. Next speaker. Hola. Buenas tardes para todos los presentes. Mi nombre es Rosa Mazariego. Soy este vendedora ambulante en Fashion Distrito desde 1993. Uh, okay. Un segundito, señora. Hace otro la. Sí. Yeah, good afternoon for all everybody here present. My name is Rosa Mazariega and I am a street vendor in the Fashion District in 1993. Continúe. Yo quiero hacerle este una pequeña recomendación a todas las personas que están en contra de nosotros, que no quieren que nos paguen la cuota de pagar, que por favor se pongan su mano en su conciencia y que hagan ver que nosotros no podemos estar pagando tanto dinero. A mí me toca renovar. Um, ok, so uh, I just want to um, uh, like really call the attention to all of those who they do, do not want to reduce this price. Please put your hand on your consciousness. So we really cannot pay so much money. And now I need to renew my permit. 
me toca renovar este, mi permiso ahora en enero, pero por lo pronto no tengo ese dinero, por eso es que no lo he sacado y por eso necesitamos que nos bajen la cuota. Y por favor, que todos los que están en contra, que se pongan su mano en su conciencia y que traten la manera de colaborar con los que están en sí, que quieren ayudarnos a nosotros. Muchas gracias. So, um, uh, so I, I don't have the money to pay. My permit was uh, expired in January. Uh, that's why I, I couldn't renew it. So please reduce the cost. And all those who are against us, just please um, put your, ma your hand on your consciousness and join those who are trying to support us. Thank you. Next speaker. Buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Víctor. Me dirijo a los concejales. Que por favor good, good afternoon to everybody. My name is Victor and I am addressing the council members that please. Les pedimos por favor que venimos a pedirle por favor que le bajen al costo, al precio de la venta ambulante del permiso. Perdón. Um, I, we are all here to ask if you can please reduce the cost of of the permit of the um, sales, like sidewalk sale, sales. Porque el precio está muy alto y muchas personas no lo pueden pagar cada the, año. The price is too high, so many people cannot pay it every year. Tenemos familia que mantener mucho, dependemos de las ventas y ahorita las ventas están bien bajas. Um, so we have a fam we have family that we need to support and we depend on these sales and now the sales are very low. Tenemos personas de la tercera edad que salen a vender sus productos y les cuesta mucho pagar su renta. No tienen ninguna ayuda de ningún gobierno. Uh, so we have elders that um, go out to sell their products and it is so hard for them to pay the rent and they don't receive any kind of support. Por eso queremos que le bajen el precio a 27.51 centavos para que todos podamos tener nuestro permiso de venta. So that's why we uh, request that you please uh, reduce the price to 27.51 cents so we can all have our permit. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Mi, mi nombre es Victoria Enríquez y quiero hacer un comentario público y comentario en el punto número dos de la, de la agenda del día de hoy. Soy vendedora ambulante de hace 10 años y vendo en la 43 Street, distrito número 9. Señores. Uh, si me espera un segundito, por favor. My name is Victoria and I want to make a public comment uh, for today's agenda and the point number two and I am a a street vendor for over 10 years on 43rd Street. Señores concejales, de este, de este comité les hago un llamado para apoyarme a mí y a mis compañeros en esta propuesta de reducir el costo del permiso de las aceras a 27.51 centavos. A so, todos los... Uh, um, so, members, uh, council members uh, for this, from this committee, um, I am calling you to please support me and support my colleagues in this proposal to reduce the price of the cost to 27.51 cents. A todos los vendedores de alimentos les ayudará a poder ahorrar para los costos de los requisitos de, salu de salubridad. Por ejemplo, de, com de comisaría 700 por mes, carritos, Cuesta ocho mil dólares. Permiso de la salubridad, 393. Me espera un segundito, por favor. So, yes, so all the food vendors, it would help us to save so we can pay the cost of other requirements that we have for, um, for like health department and 700 for commissary and 8,000 for the actual card, 300 and another permit. Si continúe, señora. 
A 772 depende el tipo de alimentos. Inspección del, del carrito, 163. Permiso de vendedor a, a, a ceras en Los Ángeles, 541. Also, yeah, so she's listing all the, all the numbers, 772, depending on the inspection of the food that they sell, and 163, another permit for selling at, on the streets in Los Angeles, and 481 for this permit. Annuales. Th thank you, your time has expired. That's annual, 441 annual. Okay, se le acabó el tiempo, señora. Okay, next speaker, thank you. Um, I'd like to speak on item three for general comment. Um, my name is Isabella Rojas with the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce. I'm writing to express my support for the public privacy partnership with the AEG group, which would expand and modernize the LA Convention Center. The LA Convention Center is in dire need of modernization. The facility's current limitations have prevented us from attracting large high value events. It's too small, too old, and its exhibition space is disjointed. The convention center stands as stark contrast to the booming neighborhoods surrounding LA Live, and it's time we stop squandering potential revenue and turn our convention center into a cornerstone of our city's economic growth. Additionally, while some may be concerned by the financial impact of this project, there is no general fund impact in the current year as a result of the recommendations proposed in the latest report. Overall, completing this modernization project will not cause the city of Los Angeles financial problems. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good afternoon, Council Members. Adam Burke, President and CEO of Los Angeles Tourism and Convention Board, here to speak on item number three and to advocate for the urgent modernization of the Los Angeles Convention Center under the P3 proposed with AEG Plenary Group. As your contractor, we believe we have a serious obligation to give you the most accurate, up-to-date data possible to inform your decisions. And based on more than four decades of experience booking the center and multiple independent studies by Oxford Economics, we have serious concerns about the data presented by CAO to date. As you know, citywide conventions are booked up to a decade in advance, so failure to complete the modernization by 2028 will cost our community over $6 billion in revenue, and that includes small businesses across every council district of Los Angeles. AEG Plenary has come back, as you know, and committed to the fact that they can do the modernization for a net build cost to the city of $43 million a year. Oxford Economics projects that a modernized center will generate $69 million a year in general fund receipts. It's one of the best ways for us to reinvigorate downtown, and I thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, my name is Alicia Rivers, and I'm here on behalf of BizFed, the Los Angeles County Business Federation. We are an alliance of over 240 business organizations who represent over 410,000 employers with 5 million employees in Los Angeles County, and I'm here to comment on item three, the Los Angeles Convention Center Expansion Project. Our tourism and hospitality industries are vital to our local economy, and we support efforts that bring needed revitalization projects to our region. This expansion project will give a competitive edge to LA over other top tier cities like Dallas and Las Vegas. This in turn will support our local restaurants, hotels, attractions, and other areas LA has to offer. While not a 2028 Olympics project, the city council must act now if it wants a new convention center by the time we are once again on the world stage. We encourage the passage of the amended CAO-CLA report asking for the APCLA to work with the city for updated plans for alternate, alternative financing that won't impact the next few fiscal cycles. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Next speaker. Good afternoon. Nella McCosker with CCA here to speak in strong support for the Convention Center expansion and modernization via P3. Um, we fully appreciate that this committee, this council, faces difficult budget cycles and that you're making important investments uh, to combat homelessness, to keep a strong workforce at the city. It is just as crucial and possible to do both and invest in this Convention Center as well. 30 years ago, the council made this investment and they faced a decision to move funds to make it happen. No one is looking back at that and saying, I wish we didn't. 
Um, that will be the next legacy of this expansion and modernization. You heard Adam Burke, 69 million um, in general fund revenue to the city, so it does have impact um, on the city's budget. It, it is so necessary for downtown as well. Um, I have heard from members and stakeholders that it is single-handedly the most important project to signal the city's support for our, our, our CBD, um, and we urge you to move it forward today. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Thank you. Uh, my name is Eddie Alvarez. I'm the council rep for the LA, LAOC Building Trades. Uh, speaking on item number three, uh, we, I'm up here to uh, obviously support the expansion and renovation of the convention center. Um, between now and 2028, this city will host the Super Bowl, the World Cup, the NBA All-Star Game, the Olympics, and hopefully a few World Series games. Uh, to host these world-class events, we have to have a world-class venue to, to house uh, the auxiliary events that go with these. Um, as we travel around the country, as, well, as some of us do through, through this, we see these places and, and, and what they add to the event themselves. So, uh, you know, this will be built, obviously, with the best locally skilled and trained labor force in America, which we are very proud of. Uh, but beyond the job, this is good for our city and our, and our region. Thank you very much. Thank you. I believe that's the last speaker that makes us all the names called. No other names are on the queue. So uh, let's move forward. Uh, colleagues, I had suggested that we take um, items 1, 5, 6, 7, 9, 11, 13, 14, 16, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, and 25 on consent. Does any member wish to pull one of those items? I know there's a lot. Uh, seeing that, let's call the roll on the consent agenda. Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Harris Dawson. Yes. McOsker. Yes. Rodriguez. Aye. Four ayes on those items have been approved. Okay, great. Uh, next, we're going to hear uh, item two, followed by item four, followed by item three, eight, 10, 12, 15, and 17. Uh, so let's start with item two. Item two. Item two, city administrative officer report relative to an updated sidewalk and park vending fee study. Good afternoon. My name is Felipe Chavez. I'm with the Office of the CAO. Uh, the CAO report before you today is in response to a City Council instruction of June 28, 2023. Uh, the Council instructed the CAO to conduct a new fee study to determine the annual sidewalk and park vending permit fee that excludes enforcement. The Council also instructed the CAO to report on a sliding scale based on the annual income of street vendors. However, this report only addresses the revised permit fee without enforcement. The revised fee of $27.51 is based solely on the cost incurred by the Bureau of Street Services to process and issue a sidewalk vending permit. According to BSS, the staff assigned to process permits is a senior administrative clerk at an hourly rate of $34.16 plus the cap rate and the 20 minute processing time. It is noted that the initial annual fee for sidewalk vending permit was $541, $541, which was based on full cost recovery and the projected issuance of 16,000 permits. The council subsequently reduced the fee to $291. These fees resulted in receipts of about $200,000 annual, annually between fiscal years 2019-2020 and fiscal years 2022-2023. Approval of the recommendations will recover the administrative costs of issuing sidewalk and park vending permits should the city continue to issue 944 annual permits at $27.51 per permit, the resulting revenue will be about $25,000, $26,000. However, the journal fund will be required to pay for the cost of enforcement for sidewalk and park vending. In 2023-24, enforcement and outreach costs are estimated to be 3.8 million. Lastly, it is also noted that the annual sidewalk and park permit will be valid for food and merchandise on sidewalks and parks and mobile and stationary vending. This concludes my presentation. I am available to answer any questions 
we have a representative from the Bureau of Street Services here and also my colleague, uh, Christine, who can also respond to any questions. Great, uh, I guess my first question is, what do people get for these permits? The question is, what do they get for the permit? Yeah. It allows them to sell or vend their merchandise and or food uh, in the public right of way on the sidewalk. Right, but they're, they're already allowed to by law, correct? I mean, the state law says you're allowed to vend uh, uh, on our sidewalks and, and you have to be, and we have city laws that say you have to be a certain a distance from a fire hydrant and you can't do this, you, you can't do that. So that's already allowed. So what does the permit actually get the person? What it does is it at least allows the, the people who um, actually pay for this permit enforcement um, to allow them to set up and if someone, you know, does not have a permit, it would allow that person who does, you know, um, better service, I guess you could say, to allow them to, to vend there in that location and not, you know, um, crowd up the sidewalk or anything like that for ADA violations and, and accessibility. But they still have to, you can't do ADA violations, you can't do accessibility. Um, you're dying for a follow-up. I, I still have questions, but if you wanted to ask your follow-up, go ahead. Well, I... I I, yeah, I have a, a few comments that I want to make, but I, you know, because I'm tired of us dancing around this issue. So if, go ahead and ask your questions, but I think we got to really hone in on what the failures are of this policy. Uh, so I, I just, so whenever you're ready, let me know. Right. Okay. Well, I mean, because that's, it's related to that. I mean, we have this permit process, which I never really understood at the beginning anyway, because we allow sidewalk vending and, and by state law and by city law. So I don't know that people are getting much for their permit. And then we're processing, it's saying 20 minutes processing. What are we actually processing? The name and address? Well, if, if they're getting food, they have to process the permits that they're getting from the health department, the, the business tax license, the, and um, the but, uh, but state I mean, tax. But they have to get a health department. In order to vend food, you have to have a health license. Okay. Correct. And so when you say we're processing, are we then, when someone applies for a city permit, are we double checking to make sure they have a, a county permit? Yes, they have to have the county permit, they have to have the state seller's permit. So they, they have to, but are we, are we actually checking on that or are we just saying you attest that you have this check? No, they have to bring the physical copy of the permits. Whatever they right. require, they have to bring physical copies. Right. But they have to have that to vend anyway? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm, still, I'm still a little bit at a loss of what what people get for, for get, like why, why have a, why not just register, have a database and have people register for free and say I'm a vendor, sign on to a database, put your name and address down and, reg and, and now you're known that you're vending. Um, I'm not sure like what value are we adding by, ha by issuing a permit at all? Well like I said if, if there's, if there's no enforcement, then they're just going to set up wherever they want to. They're going to be in tree well, no, no, we, be we in have enforcement. Right. We have, we're not paying for enforcement out of the permit anymore. Uh, so the enforcement would still be there. You have to do ADA. You have to do everything. I don't see how that's related to the permit. Well, to us, it's, tie, it's tied together because if someone obtains the permit, they're, they're going to want a service to, for someone who doesn't have a permit that they're legitimate and they're setting up correctly and when someone else doesn't set up correctly, you know, they end up calling us and then we go out and we talk to them and, and But to, to set up to correctly them. means being in compliance with the law, mm -hmm. which everyone has to be whether you have a permit or not. If I, if I may add, um, initially the, the intent of uh, the permit was to make it a full cost recovery. So initially um, there was an expectation that around 16,000 permits would be issued at a certain rate and for which what the city would recover the, the, the costs. But the cost primarily really only is about enforcement. Correct. And so if we're going to take enforcement costs off the table, the $3.8 million that we're spending on enforcement, enforcement of ADA and enforcement of these other things, which I understand the reason why we're taking that off the table, if we're taking that off the table, what's the point of paying for a permit if we're not going to recover those costs? The only costs we're recovering are the costs of printing the permit. 
the processing, the administrative clerks processing the permits. However, um, we're, we're responding to the council's request. Um, no, I, and, I, and I get, I'm, uh, by the way, this is not, uh, you're doing what you're supposed to do, but I'm trying to understand because if we're giving you foolish directions, I want us to understand it and change those directions. I don't want us to be sort of blindly going, going forward. Part of the permit is people want to be legitimate and feel that they have something, and I get that, and that's important. That's why we could even have a database with a registration and you can sign your name up and then print your registration because it doesn't sound like we're adding anything to this process. Um, but Ms. Rodriguez, I'll let you continue. Wanted to, I, I've got another line of questioning, but I know Thank you're following you. up on this, so go Thank ahead. Thank you, and, and, and it might help answer some yeah. of the questions where I think the, the failures have been, because it's not, it's not the staff's fault. It's just not. Um, primero quiero decir gracias a todos los vendedores a participar en su gobierno. Okay, gracias por venir. I want to thank all the vendors for coming and participating in their government. Uh, but we have a broken system. We have a broken system that was uh, broken by it on a few different levels. Um, listen, we could charge $1,000 for these permits. It doesn't matter. We're eating the cost and doing nothing to make sure that the people that go through the effort of legitimizing their businesses have any protections for going through that process. Whether it is the permits, from the health permits from the county. Uh, I mean, I've gone, to, I've gone to the Hollywood Bowl and people are selling uh, margaritas right there uh, or outside of, you know, outside of uh, music venues making margaritas and, and, you know, there's no regulating that. So those activities are happening. I know that this economy is rough on everybody. I fully recognize that the economy is wounding everyone. We're about to have a conversation about it, how it's further wounding our own city employees. Uh, but it would be ignorant to suggest that it was done so by the hand. I, I really have, I felt bad for street services because we've had, uh, we've, there's been a lot of um, change in direction that you've had to all adapt to. Uh, the $541, when we adapted the policy back in, what, 2019, I think it was, mm -hmm. uh, when we did it, it was, ba we, we, after we had already prepared, I'm just gonna go through memory lane here, after we had already gone through the laborious task of hearings and whatnot to establish a rational street vending ordinance, that tried to seek compliance and everyone to meet health and safety guidelines. We then quickly pivoted because we had to align with state law. And I think everything got lost in the mix. Obviously then COVID happened, there was a whole host of changes and then, oh, we can't pay for this. Meanwhile, the city is subsidizing this. Uh, but let's be honest, there is no real enforcement because that has all been pulled back. Um, because if there is enforcement, I would see more people being able to walk on the actual sidewalks or uh, I wouldn't have this, the uh, public safety concerns and issues that I've had, for example, at Hanson Dam, which in one case resulted in a shooting. So those things are very real. And what I've continued to say, because I'm a big proponent and advocate for uh, street vending, to make sure that people are safe, that we have health and safety guidelines, that there isn't an obstruction of public right of way or circumstances that create public safety hazards. Um, you know, we have, I mean, it's just, it's ironic. Uh, we have restaurants, brick and mortar restaurants that we put through the ringer uh, that are running on equally thin margins, but they've got no choice but to follow the rules. And it's a balance. It's a balance to all of those things. We're totally sensitive to creating that space for a wonderfully diverse street vending environment. But it frustrates me when I hear these, these questions, $27, it could be 500, it could be 1,000, it doesn't matter, because to your point, no one's paying them anyways. And the people that are paying them in good faith, I mean, honestly, why? If the city's gonna continue to, to eat the cost of this, let's just be real honest. Don't even pretend it's $27. I mean, what's the point? We're going to let everything go because there's uh, no political will to have really hard, honest conversations. And that is our biggest problem. So I, I just want to apologize to the staff because I know you guys are all being responsive 
to policies uh, and the confusing directives uh, that are that are ongoing. Um, I think it's you know again we have a bigger problem, and I think this is something systemic. It's just another shortcoming between uh, LA City and LA County that makes it far more complicated. I don't care if you're a brick and mortar restaurant or a street vendor. Um, you know, when you cross the street to go get your permits with County Health Department, forget it. It's, it's a labyrinth. It's, it's absolutely uh, awful. You, they can't get, there is no uh, affordable, regulatory, uh, eligible vending cart that the county could even come with. So I get it. We are always in this position to be vilified like, oh, the city, the city. Here we are again. We're always on the front line. But let's be real honest. The county has failed to come forward with a solution that makes it affordable for vendors to do it, to be in compliance in the right way as well. And, you know, I know I, we're, I'm locking arms with them. We can have this conversation all day long about how we don't want a finger point, but that is the reality. And I think it speaks to why we need to really put forward a more meaningful effort of taking some of the health department responsibilities, if we're gonna do this, that we need to do this in the city so that we can actually help people who need our help. Because that's where all of this is just causing greater problems, causing us more expenditures, uh, and no one's getting any better served uh, by it. So I, it's more of a statement than it is uh, any questions, because I know how we got here. I've been watching it for the better part of four plus years. And it's, uh, and you know, God bless you guys. We can't get you the cost recoveries that you need to sustain even some of the positions that we'll be having conversations about very shortly, unfortunately. These are the creations. This is a manifestation of indecision. This is a manifestation of the very difficult budget conversations that we're now going to have because we've never done cost recovery or because we've never been realistic about uh, what it costs to run a city of this magnitude and to make sure that everyone gets services that they deserve. So that's it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Rikoski. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I appreciate your questions and, and those comments. It sounds like no matter how we got here, we're in a position to say, let's um, spend $27,000 to earn $27,000. It's kind of a wash at the 27 bucks or whatever. I'm probably mixing up numbers. Pretty close, actually, $26,000. And going back to the chair's question of what do they get? We, get? we get a record of who pulled the permit and we can verify on the back end whether or not they're complying with other regulations. But we could also do that on the sidewalk with our enforcement with the other $3.4 million. So the, this, this $27 permit to collect $26,000 where we're spending $26,000 doesn't seem to be adding to the quality of life of Angelinos, certainly not to the vendors. And 944 permits sounds pretty small. That's a sunny Saturday afternoon in my district. I'm sure there's a lot more on any given moment than 944 vendors out there. And I'm not complaining about that. I'm just saying, really, what are we doing? And it's not your fault. It's kind of where we're at. And so I'm wondering, how are we adding value here? Um, I appreciate that we want enforcement because we want good actors and there's so many, so many great actors and we appreciate all the vendors who came and spoke today. Appreciated how well you used your time at the, podium, at the microphone. But my sense is that we should step back and take a look at what are we, what are we really doing? If we want to focus on, you know, uplifting the, the folks that are, that are struggling to follow the rules and uplifting our communities, then we look at the enforcement. But this processing a piece of paper even if it's a registry, I don't know what it, how it adds to the system. So I'm just, I'm compelled by the, by the wonderful comments from our, our uh, residents today saying that they, they want to see a lower fee, but I, I think I would take it even farther than they've taken it. What are they paying a fee for? Well, we, we have, we have rule, I mean, we have rules that are set by the uh, county in terms of the health department. We have, we, at one point we were trying to make a series of rules in terms of street vending, but state law preempted us 
on almost every aspect of that. So we can't make rules. Like if we, if we were allowed to decide where people can vend and where they can't, and we were allowed to uh, decide that, give a permit to someone to say, okay, you can be on Hollywood Boulevard between these hours and you can be on this place between these hours, then our permits would have value. But our permits don't have any value because we can't do that. So I don't know why we're charging a penny, why we even have a permit uh, from the city. Can I just ask the very direct question? Please. So what is it about our permit that allows us to enforce the rules um, any more or less vis-a-vis um, -vis a person who doesn't have a permit? Let's say, let's say I'm vendor one, I've pulled a permit. I've shown you that I have all my registration. And then vendor two has all of their other stuff, I mean their county stuff, but they haven't pulled a permit. What do we do at the sidewalk in that circumstance? I mean, at, at this current time, there's, there's nothing we can do. I mean, we can, you know, issue a citation or a notice or something like that. For the, the a citation for not having a city permit. Correct. But actually, that is, that is actually put on hold because city council put a moratorium on, on issuing citations for uh, not having a permit. So normally, that would be something that we could cite or issue a notice for. But at this current time, we cannot issue one for that. So it makes it even less meaningless, I mean, less meaningful to have, to be citing people for not having a permit. And the only reason they have a permit is because we're asking them to have a permit so that we can cite them for not having a permit. It's a weird circular thing. Like, there's no other value to this permit. Um, so I don't know. My, I mean, my, my thinking is, but I, I you know, I don't want to upend the apple cart and want to, you know, want to do right by our vendors is to, to make the permit V0 and not have a, not require a city permit. Still require all the laws that we require. You still have to be a distance from a fire hydrant. You still have to not block ADA access and, and all those enforcement, which we are paying for, which we are not using the permit fee to pay for that we have. Um, is there any reason not to do that? To, is there any reason to have a permit? The, the, the permit's not required. It's not required by state law, and it's only required by the city at this time. You're saying it is required by the state, state it's law? It's not required it's by not. state law. Uh, state law only requires um, that if the city wishes to enforce, any municipality wishes to enforce sidewalk vending, they need to have uh, provide a legal process for vendors to do it. And that's either through a regulatory process where no permits are issued or through a permit process. Right. And those options did come before the city council before. Um, but we, we have a regulatory process now. Correct. Um, the permit is just a supplement to that. Correct. It doesn't change. So nothing would change on the ground if we had or didn't have a permit. Correct. Just to be Mr. super Cosby. clear on that. Yeah. Would we be impairing our ability to enforce the laws that exist if we had a no permit or a zero fee permit? No, no. So nothing changes in our ability to enforce. So the, the st state law does require, though, to make findings with regard to um, public safety, uh, welfare, and, and health. So as long as uh, the city does make uh, those findings and establishes rules and regulations that are based on those um, factors, then uh, yes, it can, it can implement those regulations. And, and we have those, and we are implementing those. Correct. Correct. Right. Doesn't change. We don't get any more power or less power by giving permits. No. Other Correct. than the ability to cite somebody for not having the permit. Correct. I don't know. I, I, I've opened this up to my colleagues, but my, my sense is we should just, um, you know, requ not require permits and instruct the CAO, uh, you know, we can keep the second request. The, I, the, the TREAD committee had two recommendations. One was to, uh, you know, change the fee of this permit, and the other was to instruct CAO to report on funding shortfalls and potential options to meet the program goals. Uh, I would maybe just just move the second item and not the first, and say, you know, move that we remove the need for having a permit at all. So, if if I may, um, what have you been to? What have you been allowed to enforce? The rules and regulations that the city council established. Okay, so 
what has been the posture of enforcement and where? Because that has not been my experience in, in terms of, uh, I mean, we have a situation I know in Glen Oaks, which I know you guys are very familiar with. Uh, the Glen Oaks location near okay. the San Fernando swap meet and completely blocks the sidewalk. Uh, been out there repeatedly. I know we had similar issues. At, at the, actually, the other question, I'm gonna park it for a minute, is about the parks. That's a separate conversation that I want to make sure that I uh, don't conflate. But in the, situ in the circumstance of Glen Oaks Boulevard, where the sidewalk is completely obstructed, and I know there were certain locations in CD1 historically and others, was there enforcement, uh, and to what degree did it have to be repeated in order for it to be sustained in terms of uh, correcting the practices? Well, the thing is with, with the staff that I have, we respond to service requests. Mm -hmm. We have thousands of service requests a year. Yes. So unless we have a service request for that particular location, uh, a lot of times we won't be able to make it to various locations. If, right. if we don't have a complaint every day or every week, we won't be out there at that location every day, every week. Um, when we do go out, um, it was education based first, you know, letting them know that you have to obtain permits and stuff like that. Then it's issue a notice of violation, telling them you know which uh, section of the rules and regulations that they're violating. If they continue to do that, then our other option is uh, administrative citation. But in nowhere can we force somebody to move from a location to Correct. clear a sidewalk unless it's an actual ADA violation. Correct. So, but to your point, okay. So, uh, based on the number of citations, how many have been repeat? Uh, repeated uh, many 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 uh, so that's at $27 it's at $500 it's whatever you charge it the point is is that we have people that thumb their nose at this all the time anyways okay so I don't know that the answer is well let's not permit it I, I don't know that that's the answer either because we need to have some rules here guys well and, it, but the, the issue is that it, it's it's a farce the permit is a farce in the sense that well, it the, doesn't actually add to the rules or not rules. Well, no. What, what is the farce is that we committed ourselves to full cost recovery when we adopted this policy initially. That's how the $541 was derived. Am correct. I correct? That was, that was the decision that this council made was for full cost recovery. And so that we could be able to have some management over the rules. Okay, and so what's happened is consistently, because we'll find every reason, COVID obviously, we, we, you know, COVID, we were uh, restricting, it was uh, myself and Mr. Cedillo uh, that, I remember that introduced the motion uh, when, you know, because, I, you know, and again, this, these, are, these are the difficult conversations. This is welcome to leadership. It's like, these are the difficult conversations. I remember when we were going into COVID and everyone was locked up at home, and then I saw lines of people out with the vendors that had no masks, no nothing, and it was constant exposure. And I said, wait a minute, we can't have that because they're all gonna get exposed and they're gonna get sick. How is it that we were shutting down restaurants, shutting down government, we all have to work from home? And I understand, completely understand, that this is the own, only source of, uh, of earning a living. Totally understood that. But I also felt like we were also playing stupid about whether or not we were uh, enabling people to get sick and die in that moment. And it was like, I had to make a judgment call. It wasn't easy, but those were the decisions that we had to make. And so we stopped it for a bit because we were like, we don't know anything about this, uh, about this virus. And you know, how can you let the most vulnerable population continue to do what they do. I get the, the sensitivity to it, but I was also terrified, are we just letting people uh, get sick and die? Those are the tough conversations, and I know it's, it would have been much easier for us to just say, oh, no, no, this is it. But these are the tough conversations that we have to have. So I guess my point is, is that when we first adopted this policy, it was unanimously agreed upon that we were going to have full cost control, or full cost recovery, mm -hmm. so that it wouldn't be a burden to street services staff, which we always know is oversubscribed in demand and underfunded. 
And so what we've continued to do since then is redact any opportunity for you to fully recover the cost of the staffing uh, levels that provide this service. And that's, to me, the part of the hypocrisy that, bo that, that is so troublesome because I know what conversation we're going to have next, right? Because then the next conversation is going to be like, well, then why do we need you guys? Why do we need street services? Why do we need street services inspectors? They, they cost us money and they recover nothing. That's what's going to happen. I'm just laying it out there because that's going to be the subsequent conversation. And it's a hard reality and I have a hard time saying that because just as I want to protect these vulnerable individuals that are trying to earn a living, I know we have vulnerable city staff that are just trying to do their job. And so I have a really big problem of eradicating uh, any type of permit that helps enable some portion of cost recovery. What I'd like is the cooperation of everybody to understand that in order for us to sustain this city, we all have to do our part. And it shouldn't be at the detriment of one to another. That's, uh, that's my position. So I am not comfortable with eliminating a permit. I think there are clearly some challenges that everyone's experiencing. The wheels keep coming off this economy. If you can find a newspaper that has a journalist able to write it, they're telling you the story. It's going to continue to get tough, folks. But what I'm concerned with is we're just helping to enable an environment that's going to continue to say we don't need city staff because they can't cost recover the services that they provide. And that's my, that's my big concern. Mr. Picasso. So, so let's say uh, the current number of permits you have, uh, about 944, for full cost recovery on your $3,800,000 budget, it's about $4,000 a permit. There's no such thing as full cost recovery here. So at $500, that's a pretty steep discount on full cost recovery because I don't think anyone's proposing $4,000 per permit. My sense <coughs> is that folks came and they made a request for a reduction. They'd be happy with that reduction that keeps a permit in place. But it's a permit that is paying for the person processing the permit. This is like a Monty Python skit. Mm -hmm. So I'm. I'll be fine with the permit, but full cost recovery, we were telling folks, give us $4,000. That's not something I'm willing to do. But Mr. McCosker, the, the point is, is that if more people were compliant because the original estimate was that 60,000 vendors, how many, how many vendors do we estimate are in the city of Los Angeles? Initially, oh, 50,000. 50,000? Yes. So 50,000 vendors, but only 900? or so have uh, filed a permit. 944. And, right. So we have how many vendors estimated? I mean, you guys are out there. How many vendors do you think in practicality we actually have? 50,000? It's probably pretty close. Right. So if we were actually doing enforcement and doing the, the you know, it's like cannabis licenses. I, I, there's plenty of examples. Yeah. But at, su at some point, we're going to have to say that this will incent the proper uh, health and safety regulations that we need to have for everyone's public health and safety. And so, again, I have completely sensitive to it. Trust me. But at the same time, my goodness, we need to do the hard, the hard conversations that I, listen, I, it's going to get harder, folks. Which is why we should focus on things that actually improve the lives of folks. The gentleman who asked the question at the podium, what am I getting? That was the right question. Absolutely. And unfortunately, it doesn't seem like they're getting anything out of this permit. But it, I'm, I'm happy if, if you all want to keep it going and keep it at the $27. We can move that forward. You know, it's, again, it's paying, as you said, it's, it's circular. It's paying to have somebody process it. I mean, if all 50,000 people paid, it would be 1.3 million, which still wouldn't cover the, uh, the cost of enforcement. And it's not, and I know uh, Rodriguez wants us to, to have more rules about this, but part of it is we have been preempted by the state from doing almost anything in terms of regulations. But not completely. 
and we're, we're enabling an obstruction for them to actually help make sure that those rules are fulfilled, the, the rules that we do have available to us aren't fulfilled. And so that's the part that's problematic for me because we should have full cost recovery. We should have protections in place. Um, but the problem is, is that we're not even holding everybody's feet to the fire consistently uh, for those that are going through the process to actually respect what the rules are. And so there should be an incentive for people to follow the damn rules. But, but, but a lot we of keep areas. Stripping our staff, our, we keep stripping our city staff from being able to do that. Uh, We're doing it. Sure. Uh, part of it is also we, we are making a determination that while full cost recovery is enforcement, there's a lot of things that the city do, does that we do not require folks to pay for their own enforcement. So I get why we're saying we're taking enforcement out of the cost recovery. Uh, but if we take enforcement out of the cost recovery, there's really nothing left to recover other than the cost of somebody processing the paper, which is kind of a waste of uh, resources. But we're spending a lot of time on this, and it's not, it's not a lot of money, and uh, it's a lot of money. I mean, the $27 uh, a person is a lot, and, and the 500 certainly is a lot, but from a city perspective, the $27 is, again, is, is this, this circular thing. So, uh, prepare to entertain the motion. We can, we can concur with the committee and, uh, you know, reduce the fee to $27 and instruct the CAO to report on the funding shortfall, uh, which I, I, getting a sense is the will of this body, or we could just eliminate it entirely, which I'm comfortable with, too. So. Colleagues, does anyone care to weigh in on that, or we'll just move forward? I'll move the $27 and see whether or not that generates more permits. Okay. We'll take it. This is an ongoing dynamic thing, but we'll take that step today. I'll, I'll second that. Any other comments, questions? Seeing none, let's call the roll. Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Harris Dawson. Yes. McOsker. Yes. Rodriguez. Aye. Four eyes, and the item has been approved. Great. Thank you. So next we're going to go to item, thank you all very much. Um, we're going to go to item four, which, you know, we have a couple of head, head bangers today, and item four is certainly a, a big one. Uh, as we're waiting for folks to come up, I'm going to say a few words, which is, you know, in a few months, the, this committee will publicly review, alter, and vote on the mayor's draft budget, a document that's being crafted now. And while I'm yammering, feel free, CAO and folks, to come up to the front table. Uh, there have been some strong headlines recently painting LA's finances as doom and gloom. Uh, and as chair of this committee, I thought I'd share some, some thoughts and perspectives as we get started with this item. There will be a budget fall. There's no sugarcoating that. There are many reasons for that. Uh, certainly the pending raises for large swaths of city workers and the reality that large pots of funding in the state and city, that the state and federal that we receive, uh, that we receive through COVID are just not going to be there anymore. The city operates on a balanced budget system, meaning that every year we write a budget unique to that specific year and have to back up that number with tax revenues. The CAO is in charge of making these equations add up and draws the short straw of having to unveil bad, sometimes good, news to the council offices. Our CAO also leads in the negotiation of the union contracts. This is relevant because the city just struck a pending deal with a coalition that represents city workers that includes seven raises over the next half decade and that will add up to a cost of hundreds of millions of dollars. While this is a needed step to avoid a labor dispute uh, and the fact that our city workers must be able to afford to live within the city that they work, it will have a dramatic impact on our future. So what does this mean? One of the big pushes the city has made over the past years was to get vacant positions filled as fast as possible, from pothole fillers to tree trimmers to clerks to make sure local businesses who contract with the city get paid. We have thousands of vacancies. With the pending labor deal, we will not be able to hire as we intended. Folks will not get fired, but residents can uh, and, and will get the same level of service as we're getting. Having said that, it means that in a lot of cases, services will not get better. They'll not get faster, they'll not, not get more efficient. This is just math. We cannot pay people more and provide more services without more revenue. Uh, and we definitely can't do that when our revenues are drying up. This is hard mathematical truth. The report details some of the, uh, the real impacts of these decisions that we've made and are going to make in the future to ensure that our, our workers are paid properly. That being said, um, we have an opportunity also to, 
to take this financial crisis and create efficiencies. Uh, but you know, make no mistake about it, you can't create efficiencies to get your way out of a fiscal crisis, but you can use this as an opportunity to, to reform this city in a positive way. And that's one of the things we're asking the CAO to do as well. So um, without further ado, I'm going to, to yield the floor to the CAO to talk, to talk to us specifically about what you're recommending, uh, why you're recommending this, and, and, and the seriousness of what is before us. Because this is a, this is a uh, very serious uh, votes that we're going to take in terms of the financial future of this city. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, and thank you for uh, setting up uh, this discussion. Um, we, are, we are here today to discuss uh, very significant current and future financial challenges facing the city and uh, to recommend immediate near-term and uh, long-term solutions to address them. Uh, specifically, um, I will I'll review our, our current challenges. Uh, sp specifically, our current year expenditures are above plan, our current year revenues are below plan, and the city has approved and will be considering major new multi-year spending in the form of employee compensation agreements that will add hundreds of millions of dollars to our base payroll. Uh, these factors uh, all combined uh, threaten to drive the city finances uh, into significant structural deficit. Uh, immediate action is required by this body to ensure city finances remain structurally sound and resilient to recession. Uh, when this committee took up our second financial status report, earlier this year or last year, we reported that uh, revenues through October were $93 million below plan. Uh, and revenues have continued to come in under projections. Through December, our general fund revenues are now $158 million below plan, mainly due to lower than expected business tax, sales tax, hotel stay tax, or TOT, uh, and documentary transfer tax. On the expenditure side, the uh, $297 uh, million in projected over expenditures has been mitigated somewhat, uh, but we still have not implemented solutions for the remaining $143 million in projected overspend for this fiscal year. So in summary, uh, for this current fiscal year, revenues uh, are down $100 and 58 million expenditures are up 143 million over plan. Uh, now for the future, um, our future concerns lie principally in the recently approved and forthcoming multi-year uh, employee contracts. Um, we earlier this year uh, approved a uh, contract, a four-year contract for uh, sworn officers uh, that has a impact of 394 million over four years and will require 75 million in new general fund spending for 24-25. Uh, we are, uh, as the chairman mentioned, uh, finalizing uh, an agreement with the coalition of city unions that represents about 80% of our civilian workforce um, and that uh, agreement is expected to add well over $100 million in additional total costs for uh, fiscal 24-25. Uh, furthermore, we have uh, pending agreements and we're, con we're currently in negotiations with all of the other uh, uh, bargaining units um, representing civilian employees outside of the coalition. And we, also, and we have the uh, contracts for sworn fire that is uh, up at the end of this fiscal year we will be beginning uh, very shortly negotiations with, uh, with those units. Um, all of these costs will uh, go into effect as we are looking at our 24-25, um, uh, as we're taking into account our 24-25 our expenditures. Um, so without action, 
uh, immediate action to reduce expenditures. Uh, these new obligations combined with our current uh, fiscal challenges would result in a $350 million to $400 million deficit heading into fiscal year 24-25. And because uh, the new expenditures uh, are principally related to compensation, um, that compensation, of course, is ongoing in nature. We are required to close the deficit in large part with ongoing or permanent reductions. Um, so how do we address these challenges with minimal impact to current service levels and while also avoiding layoffs? Uh, we'll need to take several steps uh, and one of those uh, must be taken immediately. The first, uh, the first step, uh, which we will be principally talking about today, is that the city must limit uh, non-critical hiring. This would not be a hiring freeze, but it would be uh, a temporary limitation on hiring to those uh, positions deemed critical. We would limit the hiring to critical positions, um, and uh, hopefully for a, uh, just a temporary, on a temporary basis. Number two, uh, the city must eliminate uh, non-critical vacant positions uh, this year uh, through work of this committee, through the budget process, both. Um, it, this uh, action does need to take place this year, heading into next fiscal year so that we can bring our, our expenditures and bring our budget into uh, structural balance. It would be a necessary action um, also to bring our our budget to the services that we are actually delivering. And we'll talk a, a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, but we currently have nearly $300 million of general fund uh, tied up in positions that are vacant and performing no service. Um, but it is money off the books because we do fund our positions uh, whether they are filled or not. Uh, number three, uh, uh, we, we need to pursue revenue opportunities. We will talk uh, more about that in a moment as well. Um, there, are, uh, there are significant expenditures required by the general fund in subsidizing special funds. There are other areas where we uh, can pursue revenue as well. That is part of the recommendations. And uh, lastly, we need to consider uh, restructuring our service delivery models to the extent that we are reducing uh, the size of the workforce or the size of our authorized positions. Uh, we need to look at restructuring service delivery models to provide uh, more services with fewer staff. Um, so on that, on the first item, the uh, limiting of the non-critical uh, hiring, we recommend that uh, we limit non-critical hiring uh, by setting two levels of priority. First level of priority would be uh, to identify positions categories of positions that would continue hiring without any limitation. Uh, those would be in the category of uh, critical uh, public health and safety positions, positions that would be uh, deemed to be approved under, uh, under a review, uh, positions that are critical to be filled very quickly. Uh, and the second category is um, positions that are at proprietary and special funded departments. The reason for that is um, this is a, uh, these are measures that we need to take to right size the uh, general fund and, and what, uh, what we're spending using general fund. And the uh, proprietary departments, our pension systems uh, have their, their own funds. Library would be uh, not affected by this process, neither would the Department of Building and Safety because those departments are entirely funded um, through either charter mandated uh, appropriations or uh, through special funds. On the critical public health and safety side, uh, we have identified for the council's consideration uh, positions that are related, uh, positions, excuse me, in the uh, Bureau of Sanitation, uh, on, in the Livability Services uh, Division uh, that are responsible for uh, cleanup of right of ways. Right, rights of way, uh, personnel department, the nurses that work in the jails, and sworn positions both in police and fire, including detention officers, 
and police service representatives, which are, uh, which are 911 operators. The uh, second level of uh, review or the second level of a hiring limitation that we are, uh, that we're recommending is that this council establish priorities uh, for priority critical hiring. Um, this would require a review before the hiring would be approved, um, but those, uh, those positions that fall within the categories uh, recommended or ultimately approved uh, would, be, uh, would be allowed to be filled uh, after review um, uh, by my office uh, and the CLA in consultation with the mayor's office. And those positions, those recommended uh, criteria include positions, again, uh, critical to public health uh, and public safety, positions that would be required to fulfill legal mandates, positions that would be required to reduce liability and mitigate risk, uh, positions that are critical to our homelessness response, uh, of course, positions that are fully paid for by special funds that are not subsidized by our general fund, uh, in any way. Many special funded positions are, uh, are subsidized or only partially funded by those special funds. Uh, we and so that's what requires the review before those positions would, uh, would be approved to ensure that they would be 100% funded by the, uh, by the special fund. We would also recommend that target a local hire and bridge to jobs programs. Uh, we, would, we would encourage departments uh, to fill positions, uh, to continue to fill positions through those programs, uh, and to the extent that hiring is approved, uh, hiring through the TLH or Bridge to Jobs program uh, would uh, be in one of our categories of, of priority hiring. Um, I would also add that uh, in the, uh, under the umbrella of target a local hire, Bridge to Jobs, we would include uh, positions uh, uh, related or positions hired through the Clean LA program and the workforce equity demonstration uh, projects. So that, that's in the umbrella of the uh, of priority hiring that we would that we would recommend. And then of course revenue generating positions. If it uh, brings in more than we are required to spend in salary, that would be an area where we would uh, recommend and approve uh, additional hiring. The next, the next level and the next action that um, is, is absolutely critical uh, is uh, we will need to eliminate uh, non-critical vacant positions. And as everyone on this committee knows, uh, the city has an extraordinarily high vacancy rate currently. Uh, excluding proprietaries, we have nearly 5,000 vacant positions. As I said earlier, these positions, uh, these vacant positions, tie up nearly $300 million of our general fund and uh, for employees that do not uh, exist and for services that are in the budget, but services that will not be delivered. Uh, so as part of right-sizing our, our budget um, and bringing it into structural balance, uh, we need to look at the $300 million uh, that is tied up in these vacant positions, uh, apply the analysis of what is critical uh, and non-critical, and this report recommends that, uh, that I propose to this body elimination of non-critical, of all non-critical vacant positions. So as, as our process for reviewing and determining uh, non-critical vacant positions. We will take a number of um, uh, items into uh, consideration. Uh, one certainly would be the length of the vacancy. There are, we, have, we have a number of positions that have been vacant for multiple years. Um, and, and if they've been vacant for a long period of time, we would consider that a non-critical position. Uh, we would certainly also look at the source of the funding per our, our prior review on the uh, hiring limitations or on the priority critical hiring. Uh, if they're funded with special funds, um, we would uh, not recommend uh, eliminating that position. We also will look at the ability of the department to absorb the work. Um, will the elimination of that position or uh, the permanent reduction of that, of that authority uh, affect uh, their ability to uh, deliver a, the current level of service? 
Um, we, will, we will be looking at service level data uh, and throughout we will be, uh, we will take care to ensure that no filled positions are eliminated. Uh, I am not saying that that is not something that we may need to look at in the future, but the goal of, uh, of these recommendations is to put us into a position where we will not need to take those more drastic steps. If we, if we right size our budget now, and so that we, and so we have a structurally balanced budget in 24, 25, and we are not chasing a deficit for the next several years as we're absorbing the cost of the new contracts, um, we will be in a much stronger place in a, in a, in a place where we will be able to, um, on in, in, in an appropriate way, add services if and when revenue uh, comes in uh, at, at or above plan. So the question is, well, what, these are actions that seem to be a uh, complete U-turn or 180 degrees from where the, city's, uh, where the city has been up until this point. We've been trying to Im improve our hiring process, fill as many vacancies as possible. Um, what is this gonna do to services? Uh, the, because we are focusing on limiting hiring, uh, uh, limiting the hiring to only critical positions, um, we believe that there will be minimal immediate service impacts uh, because we are talking about um, limiting non-critical hiring and we're talking about eliminating vacant positions that aren't performing services currently. But what this will uh, trigger, and this will very likely have uh, an impact on any plans to increase services or to launch new programs. So in taking this action, uh, the council does need to understand that uh, we will not be in a position uh, this year or next at a minimum to ask departments to increase services or perform extraordinary uh, services or extraordinary tasks. We need to be very honest and focus on the core mission of the departments and understand that we will not be in a position to increase uh, service levels or add and certainly not add new services uh, for uh, it's at least this year and next uh, until we are in a uh, structurally balanced position. Um, last quickly, and then we'll get to your questions, uh, the report also recommends uh, instructing my office to uh, look at uh, revenue opportunities, uh, both internally and externally, that could potentially even include uh, ballot measures uh, to fortify the general fund. One of the areas that we report on uh, annually uh, when we're considering the budget is the uh, level of subsidy that the general fund is providing to special funds. And uh, last year, as of the proposed budget, that was another $300 million. So we have nearly $300 million tied up in vacant positions. We have almost another $300 million that we are subsidizing special funds uh, some of the uh, highlights, stormwater pollution abatement fund, a $17 million subsidy, a $65 million subsidy for the solid waste uh, resource revenue fund that is expected to go up uh, this next year. Uh, w there, are, uh, there are a number of areas in the budget where we are subsidizing either special funds or charter mandated minimums that we, that we need to address. Um, we will report back on that. And then lastly, um, we, to the extent that uh, the uh, priority critical hiring process and the elimination of vacant positions uh, has service impact, we would look at restructuring, uh, potentially uh, consolidating some uh, service delivery models uh, to maintain at least the current level of services uh, as we move forward. So with that, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I'll open it up for questions and I'll have the uh, principal recommendations on the screen. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. And, and just to underscore some of what you said, I mean, if we move forward on this, we are voting on directing you to eliminate vacant positions. And that'll happen through the process as we move forward. But that's, that is a very serious direction that we would be giving you. You talked about um, the subsidies, you know, potential revenue through elimination of subsidies, which is something we're going to have to do. But I also want to have eyes wide open what that means. Uh, it sounds great and, and sounds like, oh, that sounds like free money. It's not. It's, it means the fees go up for stormwater 
to our taxpayers. The fees go up for solid waste to our taxpayer. Uh, I'm saying this not, you know, just, just to have eyes wide open so we know what we're, what we're dealing with. It's serious stuff. Um, the, the priority critical hiring, when will that process actually begin? Uh, we would begin that process immediately upon council approval of these recommendations. Okay. And then the, the, the time frame in terms of bringing those recommendations forward, do we have a time frame on that or do we need to put The recommendations for position elimination or yes. the recommendation. So right. that, that is, uh, I do not have a time frame on that. We would uh, begin the work of, of review. We have, uh, we have begun that as we're, as we're reviewing department budgets, um, but we would, we would bring that forward as, as quickly okay. as we could. I mean, we could put it, I mean, and I guess it would also be in tranches, right? Because the, the, the easiest one would be the elimination of, you know, positions that are five years vacant or more, and then it would get tougher as you, as you go through. Is that right? Or would you do it all in one shot? Uh, we, would, we would need to think about that. I, I, would, I, would, um, I would think we would want to do it in, in a comprehensive report so we could see the full, the full picture of, of what we were uh, proposing. Um, but we can, we can work with you on that. Okay, and then uh, the special fund issue, I wanted to just to clarify that a little bit. And, you know, I had some general managers contact me, like, like for example, you know, Rec and Parks, we have part-time folks that are funded by LA28 um, that, that do a lot of the, the after-school programs. How would those be treated if they're not, uh, if they're funded outside of the general fund? So that, that, that is a specific call out in our, in our uh, priority hiring. Um, if, if in fact the position is, and Rec and Parks is a very good example, by the way, because it is mostly a general funded department. It is a heavily subsidized department um, over and above the charter mandated minimum. Um, and we would, we would need to uh, take a look at the position and if it is indeed a, a fully funded position by, in this case, LA-28, or another source of special funds, that would be approved for hire. Great, thank you. Colleagues, uh, Mr. McCosker. Thank you, thank you very much. I was gonna ask about the LA-28, so I do appreciate, appreciate that. I mean, this could, have, uh, in fact, have the effect of, you know, causing us to work more diligently to make sure we can fill positions like those that are funded, and I know it's been it's been hard because probably because of personnel practices to get those positions filled. I want to go in another category on the um, uh, bridge to jobs and the and the TLH. There are programs that are like those that exist, like um, I think it's Clean LA and uh, the worker equity demonstration that I believe uh, sanitation uses. Would those programs similarly fit into that category that we would be looking to hire? Um, into departments at those levels? Yes, they would, uh, and, and we, we would consider that under the, under the umbrella of uh, target local hire, bridge to jobs as, as, a, as a priority. And, and as you said, you know, this is not a recommendation. These aren't actions that we want to take, but one of the potential silver linings is by raising these programs to the level of priority hiring. Um, it may uh, incent departments to even use uh, these programs even more to hire if this is one of the few areas that they would get hiring approved. Yeah, but to be super clear, we're really talking about TLH type programs because there are programs that don't call themselves TLH that do virtually the exact same thing. Specifically, uh, Clean LA and the Workforce Equity Demonstration uh, right. program would be included. Okay, good, thank you. Yes. Ms. Rodriguez. Yes. Um, so when we were in the process of uh, reviewing the proposed uh, contractual, the contract negotiations that were proposed for LAPD, there were comps uh, associated with that that ascertained that we were in fact uh, below a number of the incentive, uh, below a number of the incentives for starting salaries and everything for the police department uh, when we were negotiating that, those contracts, correct? We, we, we did provide We did that, comps, yes. okay. Mm -hmm. uh, have comps been provided with the current proposed salary increases that are contained within the uh, negotiated 
uh, terms of, of uh, this uh, coalition contract? So the, the coalition uh, represents, um, you know, well, I'll start with PPL. Um, PPL represents a handful of classifications. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were able to do uh, comparisons because we're talking about um, probably a total of less than 10 total classifications. I might be wrong about that, but it is a handful of classifications represented by the Police Protective League. The, uh, largest one, of course, is a uh, police officer. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we don't have that level of uh, comparative analysis for uh, all of the classifications that are represented by coalition unions. We have some for some, uh, but, I, but I, I will not be able to provide that um, on a comprehensive basis uh, to the council for consideration. So we have some for some, so for those that we have, uh, was it determined that the salaries were within the same range? Uh, what, were the, what were the comps? What did they reveal? Because, and, and I'm asking, I'm, you know, I, I just want to put all these questions out on the table for everybody because I'm really worried about having the best paid unemployed city workforce. Uh, because what we're talking about is a dynamic that you know, we're, we're having a very hard conversation about having to eliminate a lot of positions uh, and just wiping them off the books and not in the foreseeable future because, and I appreciate the simplicity with which you provided this, the graphic that shows very clearly what's happening with our uh, revenue and what's happening with our expenditures. And that dynamic is basically, we're, we're conveying to the public, we're going to decimate our city workforce in order to provide that. And I just want to make sure that we're being very responsible and thoughtful about how we do it. So, um, so again, in that conversation, again, because I'm the only person on this uh, area that wasn't involved in those conversations, I just want to know whether or not uh, we have a sense of what those, what that looks like and uh, also, you know, just in terms of, uh, just what, what, what are the comps for those that, that you do know? So I certainly, I, I can't provide that uh, right now. Correct. I, I certainly can provide that uh, to you um, a, a, as soon as possible. Um, but I'll just tell you that it's it, not a satisfactory answer, but it's, it's a range. In some cases, we're doing quite well. In some cases, we're in the middle. In some cases, we're behind. Right. Um, but I, I'm happy to provide that to you. Okay. Um, and, and I ask the question because I'm really worried. Look, we want to provide a very healthy compensation package. We know, just as the preceding conversation was, everyone's struggling. And we're watching uh, in this. You know, we know our public sector economy lags the private sector. And we're watching the wheels fall off the private sector economy. There's no ignoring that. Uh, substantial job losses in so many different environments, it's all happening around us. And so, and, uh, so I, I look at that, I look at the fact that uh, we've had very slow hiring after the attrition through COVID and the loss of uh, staff positions through COVID, we have not replaced or filled many of those positions. So our city staff is already strung out on trying to fulfill the obligated services that we need to provide for a city the size of Los Angeles with very little support and resources, coupled with the fact that now we're saying, OK, just as we were promising you that we were going to help get you relief and we're going to help you guys out and try to hire people, now we're saying, eh, no, not going to happen because we can't afford it. Uh, and that's just not going to work. Um, meanwhile, we've in many circumstances, this, this council, in good faith, allocated well over $300 million of general fund money, uh, discretion to the mayor's office for a whole host of services. I'm just curious, uh, just, you know, in putting it in that context, I want to make sure that we're in a situation where we're all coming in eyes wide open about what that's going to look like. And so I, I really do want to see uh, those comps. And I just want to make sure, uh, because I, what, really worries me and are 
I know, I, I know what the looming conversations are going to be, is are we potentially talking about eliminating a public city workforce for contract, for contract hire workers because we still have to do the jobs, because we still have uh, ATP grants and all these other work, uh, all this other work that we need to provide, but we're going to do it with contract labor because we're not going to have the city workforce that can do it. And I'm worried about all of those things because those will continue to erode even as we have increases in revenue. It will continue to erode any gains that we make because we have no city workforce that could potentially offset or compete or provide some competitive uh, context of what a real uh, cost would be. It would be dictated by the private sector. Right? And, I, and I say this because I, I'm doing a groundbreaking for a pool renovation uh, that we didn't have the city workforce capacity to do, and the bid came in. I mean, they, you get one bid that comes in, and they dictate the price, and it's 10 times more than what we thought it was going to cost. And so these are the circumstances that we're creating for ourselves long term, that it, it, you know, I, I want to protect the stability of a city workforce and give people the relief that we kept promising them that they were going to get hired support and staff because as we have attrition and as we have retirements and those things are coming and we have a lot of retirement cliffs in many different departments that we're going to continue continue to see that and what are we going to actually are we going to be able to replace those positions and th those are the things that I'm really struggling with right now in this conversation and want to get more details uh, about that uh, separately. Um, and then also, I, I need some clarification because I know when, when it talked about the non-critical positions and what that looks like, um, I just want to ensure that there's a role for this. You know, I, I understand the report will come back uh, and it's the CAO, the CLA with uh, with the mayor's office in consultation with the mayor's office and you know for me what really is concerning is we have a lot we have some duplication particularly expensive duplication in the in the homeless services area very expensive and uh, with a lot of contract work being retained in order to do it a lot of duplication of expenses costs that should in fact be covered by the county but we're paying for it as a city my question is help me understand what the process is going to look like once because the, there's not a single council member that's apparently gonna I know the CLA will be in that meeting but there won't be a single council member as part of that and so help walk me through what that process is going to look like to determine what the critical positions, uh, what we protect or what we don't protect in this process. So the criteria for the criteria in the report that, uh, that, I, that I walked through uh, previously essentially is the instruction that you would be providing to, to myself and the CLA uh, for allowing the hiring to move forward or, or holding it back. Uh, we would also then be regularly reporting to this committee on the positions that were allowed to be hired, that were, that were deemed uh, in, uh, consistent with the priority hiring as set by the council. Uh, at the time that we report on that, the council could, uh, this committee could give uh, additional instruction, amend the instructions, amend the priorities, uh, if what you see happening is inconsistent with what you would say are your priorities. Um, but we would do that on, a, on an ongoing basis. The, the, the critical piece now is to, is to, Im, is to put a, a process in place that certainly can be amended. This is not, by the way, a process that we uh, intend to be an ongoing process. This is a, a measure that we need to take ideally for a short period of time and then we really address the problem, the, the, the challenge where we right size our, our budget with the conversation around the elimination of the vacant positions. Once we uh, right size the budget uh, and have positions that we can fully fund and we have our vacancy rates to a, a, a manageable uh, a manageable number, 
uh, then we can continue hiring, and then this committee uh, as, and the mayor would propose uh, adding positions that would be able to be filled uh, on as we're able to do so, as we're able to afford it, as we're taking on the additional costs. What we're doing here, and what I'm recommending here, is is measure a measure that we will that we need to take to to it's really a reset. Um, and you're absolutely correct, uh, council member, COVID put our, our budget and our staffing levels way out of whack. We had a period where we had a hiring freeze, then we had a period where we paid people to leave, uh, up to $80,000, we had a, a separation incentive program. Uh, then when our revenues recovered, we, we added uh, almost 2,000 positions, more than 2,000 positions in the last two years on top of very, very high vacancy rates that were created by COVID. So uh, as our revenues have come back, we've allocated the money in areas that has not been spent, which is part of the reason why we have a very, very high reserve at this time because of the reversions for unspent salary dollars. Uh, we have made a decision for some units. We will be uh, making decisions in the near future to make city work more competitive. And part of that coalition deal that will come to you increases the city minimum wage uh, to $25. Um, and that is on the principle that we don't feel that city work should be paid less than, uh, than fast food work. We are trying to get a, a, uh, our, our city employment to a level where it is less of a struggle to live, as the chairman said. Um, we, are, we won't be able to do that. We won't be able to do that for all workers, but we're getting closer with this, with this contract, and that will require offsets. So we're looking at the kind of out of whack position our budget is in because of, the, because of what COVID did to the city and did to our employment levels. We're gonna reset it, make sure that our budget's in structural balance, and if we take those actions in the next several months, we'll be in a position where we can grow appropriately uh, year over year uh, without adding services that will never be delivered because they're vacant or being in a position where we're constantly chasing a several hundred million dollar deficit um, for multiple years and never actually able to do anything. So uh, aside from LAPD, FIRE, for example, still hasn't recovered its staffing levels from pre-2008, right, from the recession. Uh, similar circumstances, same writing on the same wall. Uh, and so among our city workforce from the coalition, all these positions that we're talking about, how many of them have ever been fully recovered from the 2008 impacts of the recession? This is long before COVID happened. We came into a huge boom economically. So how many of those city departments that are now going to be exposed to this process have ever recovered I mean I know some of them I can name them uh, you know I think about street services I can think about a few but are there any that stand out that had fully recovered from even uh, post 2008 recession cuts well well what happened during the recession um, which you know the crash happened in 2008 the city started to really feel the impacts in in fiscal 910 uh, we we did some of the same things that we did during COVID, hiring freeze, uh, managed hiring, uh, early retirement incentive program uh, to reduce the city workforce uh, because it was necessary because we were in a multi-year financial crisis. The impact to our civilian workforce over that period of time uh, was a, probably a net reduction of about 5,000 employees. Uh, by 2019, we had recovered uh, just over 4,000 of those uh, of those employees, or at least our our, our level, um, uh, recovered almost to the pre-recession level, almost, and then COVID hit. So if you look at the chart, which I I do have, but I don't have it in this presentation, it goes uh, from 2008 down, and then we we consistently build from about 2013 to uh, to 2020, and then it falls off again. But was it uh, to the departments that were most impacted by the cuts in 2008? Was, well, it, was, it, was it aligned where the recovery occurred for the staffing levels uh, to the departments that were most impacted by those cuts? 
So don't give me the general number. I'm saying if you cut street services and they were down here, mm -hmm. did you when it, are they part of that 4,000 that helped get us closer to their full recovery or not? Well, I would, I, we, could, we could provide that analysis on a, on a department by department okay. level. So I could, we, we, we can look into that. I mean, there were, there were many things that, that took place, including additional revenue that came in. And then we also did consolidation. So there were some departments that literally never recovered because we eliminated them during mm -hmm. the recession, we, or we consolidated the work into other, uh, into other departments. Mr. Harris Dawson for a follow up. Yeah, just a, a quick uh, interjection. Uh, pardon me, Ms. Rodriguez. So to Ms. Rodriguez's question, so I know you don't know the full picture, but are there outliers? So for example, we know LAPD didn't go on this same track that you just described. Are there ones who did really well and ones who did really poorly? At least, could you give us the big shiny ones, even though you, I, I recognize you can't give us all of them? So, so certainly, yeah, LAPD, absolutely. That, that uh, because the, the city continued to hire during the recession, uh, and at that time we were the only agency that was hiring, so we were able to, to at least keep hiring to attrition, um, as was the priority of the mayor at the time. Uh, the library, because of the way we fund the library, um, maintained, um, basically maintained service levels. Um, the, uh, you know, the proprietary departments did okay, DWP did okay. Really, the, the, the general funded departments were the ones that, that took the, the, the biggest hit and took the longest to recover. Um, I would I would need to go back and look at a, on a department by department basis yeah. to see it to see which of the, the outliers. Because the proprietaries, I mean, they're they're protected in this. The the proprietaries are protected in this conversation right now. So, it you know, there's no point in including them in that conversation because they're you know they're not general funded. Um, the other question I had was about uh, borrowed staff. There are a number of positions from different departments that are on loan. Uh, to different offices. Uh, is that also going to be reflected when we have conversations about the departments that are going to be impacted, where the cuts are going to be proposed? Because right now, you have people that are, uh, you know, uh, on loan uh, from a department, and it's putting a strain on the department. Is that going to be uh, considered in this conversation, and are those departments going to, uh, how, how will that be handled? We wouldn't be able to. We wouldn't be able to report on that um, because a, a, a position that's on loan to, from one department to the other, it would. It still shows in the. It's you know, their home department. Uh, if the position is filled, then it's then it's filled. It wouldn't. It wouldn't factor in. It wouldn't show up as a vacancy. It wouldn't show up as a position we're eliminating. It wouldn't show up as a position that we're recommending for not hiring. So, mm -hmm. uh, I would. We would maybe need to dig it down a little bit. So then bit. maybe what we need is a report for from by department to consider uh, who's got staff on loan uh, so that we could actually better ascertain what the impacts are to those departments. Uh, for example, whether it's the planning department, I, you know, I've, I've been waiting, we've all been waiting uh, for a number of our communities, but planning department I know is really strained for services. I still don't have a community plan. Uh, and I've got light rail coming through. So, I mean, there's a lot of uh, factors to consider, and when staff is getting loaned out for other purposes, it actually further puts services to the city at a deficit. Uh, and frankly, obviously supplements, uh, you know, resources in another space. So I just, I, I'd, like, uh, I'd like to also, when, when you provide some of this information, I know we're talking about the restoration of the positions, you get me some of that data. Uh, in terms of the recovery from 2008. But I would like to know by department how many departments uh, have uh, folks out on loan because it does have direct implications to how we do service delivery for these departments. They're stretched. And we have to have, if we're, my big concern is that I, I wanna make sure that when we have this conversation, we're having the full conversation. Uh, there's a lot, like I said, a lot of duplication with homelessness, a lot of expenditures and money being spent, uh, money being spent on services uh, that should be paid for by the county, but because we're not fulfilling any of the alliance alignment, 
you know, those problems, th that's, it's, it's uh, creating greater issues for us financially. So, um, okay, and then uh, my last question is uh, the, uh, the contracting, uh, the, the contracting out of the workforce in terms of uh, where, we, where we are currently in terms of uh, utilization of contracting and, and really reflecting based on, like I said, some of the grants. Uh, you know, I've, like I said, I've got ATP grants. I've, you know, uh, Bob has ATP grants. We all have like hundreds of millions of dollars of state grants for capital improvement projects. Uh, if we cut these vacancies and city staff isn't able to do it, then what we're proposing is figuring out how we're going to do this contractually, right? Contract labor and like it, that's that's a much larger scale example. But how is that going to be with potentially any other uh, any other um, positions? So so uh, one of our uh, areas, uh, one of our criteria for review uh, is whether the department can absorb the work. Uh, there is no recommendation in the report that uh, asks departments to in, uh, prioritize or to enhance their use of contract work or contracts. We are not recommending that. We are trying. We will ascertain um, to the greatest extent possible what the department can continue to do um, w if a they're not allowed to fill the position that they'd like to fill, or b if that position or that vacant position is is eliminated. Certainly, if there are positions that are assigned to managing a grant and complying with, with the uh, regs of that grant, uh, we, that would be a consideration that, that would warrant, A, that position not being eliminated, or B, that position being hired if they're requesting it to be filled. Okay. Thank you. And of course, oftentimes, most of the time, contracting out ends up being more expensive than actually doing the work in-house. So that's, that's not yeah. as good. So that's got to be part of it. And you certainly raise the issue, you know, out of this crisis, there's an opportunity to look at, you know, deduping a lot of our, our, our positions and making sure that we're more streamlined. So. Uh, colleagues, any additional comments or questions on this? Yeah, I want, uh, I want to define deduping for me. <laughs> <laughs> when you have basically duplicate responsibilities. Oh, deduping. Oh, gotcha. In multiple gotcha. departments. And uh, you. Yeah. I, I get you, I get you. I do have a couple of real questions. Yes, I was yes. just kidding. Um, the contracting is particularly sensitive. I mean, I would hate to put us in a position where we're going to rely, where we would, one would expect that we would rely more on contracting out. Uh, we do have, we do have provisions of administrative law that prevent, prevent us from unduly contracting out. There's nothing about this hiring plan that would change the requirements on us for explaining why we would contract out work that could be done by city workers, correct? No, there's nothing in there that addresses that at all, no. So we have pretty significant protections in laws that we've adopted and stand by that require us to explain why we're contracting out. And uh, go to, and our labor partners would, would carefully watch that, as they always do. So you are not suggesting in any way, shape, or form that we would increase our contracting out? Not in any way, shape, or form. And, and to just to add to that, the goal of this, um, of these actions, of these recommendations, is to reduce expenditures. So right. we're not we're not recommending replacing uh, ongoing expenditures for uh, other forms of ongoing expenditures that, as the chairman said, may be more expensive. That's we're not in a position to, to recommend that. And in so fact, as we're as we're going through the budget development process, you know, and, and making our recommendations, um, we will be. Um, well, I'll say as we as we consider the, I would not be. You you can expect from our office that we will be um, consistently recommending against uh, additional or increases in service for this next year. Right. So logically, with the five thousand vacant positions we have now, and the level of contracting we have, which today complies with the law, if we were not filling those positions and carefully filling carefully filling positions according to a plan, it wouldn't lead to a logical conclusion that we would be increasing contracting out. It would mean that we would be providing the level of service we provide today. 
That is, that is the goal. It is, it is a, a uh, the recommendations are designed to reset the budget, to bring it into structural balance with a, a holding pattern of uh, a steady state of city service level. So more minute detail, more immediate concern is we've had a, I'm switching subjects now, we've had a number of job fairs. You know, we were gung-ho for a year saying, come work for us. We've had a ton of job fairs. The job fairs have been successful. We talked about same-day hiring. It didn't always result in same-day hiring. It resulted in processes. For folks in the process today, before Friday, if we're going to consider this on Friday, will we be continuing that process and committing to tentative offers or conditional offers or processes that are in place today? If, if conditional offers have been made, uh, those would continue through the process, yes. We would not be shutting those down. Okay, and I have a, a nitpicky question maybe of the clerk. Uh, do we need to put into the record uh, that at the bullet where we say the TLH and the bridge jobs is essentially going to be, um, uh, will continue on in critical services, do we need to add Clean LA and the, the, the WED, the worker equity demonstration, or did we just do that? I think you just did that, sir. Thank you. Sir. Okay. If, I, if I could on the Clean LA, um, so I just want to be clear, I understand what the pathway is, but we've also, again, when we come back to conversations around duplicative, mm -hmm. it is among one of the programs that is duplicative. So I just want to be sure. I think you and I both uh, did a motion on that. Yep. Yep. So, I, so again, I don't want to send mixed signals about it uh, because I know in my circumstance it's been a problem. They haven't even showed up to locations that they claim that they're doing work in. Yeah. So I, I just want to be clear. I think we can, I'm comfortable with the notion of saying, look, these things are all priorities for us, uh, for the areas that we want to focus on hiring, but at the same time, that is one of the biggest red flags that I've seen in terms of uh, its non-performance and its uh, duplication in nature. Yeah, I want to, just to clarify, I mean, I would, my purpose is to go after the sort of the equity of, of, mm -hmm. re, mm -hmm. of providing jobs and career paths through those programs, sure. but that would not trump our desire, in wrong, fact, wrong word. trumping, yeah, our highest desire would be to reduce duplication and make sure that we are okay. consistent with the motion that you and I did together. Okay. It might not eliminate such a program, though, across the city. It, it, it would make sure that we are being smart about how we're conducting work. Okay. And one of my colleagues, you know, we, we are giving forward direction right now, but we are going to be monitoring this. It may be a standing item in, in budget, uh, and, and certainly personnel is going to look at this stuff as well. As, as we start going through this, we're going to be looking at it and, and tweaking the priorities. That's, that's our prerogative as a council, and uh, if we don't like the direction that it's going, we, we, can, we can set different priorities, and we're going to be hearing about it as we go. But, but today, we have a decision to make, and that is to, to give this very serious direction to the CAO, and they've, they've outlined it, uh, and I'm going to... You know, Ms. Rodriguez, I think you had some amendments you wanted to add. Do you want to uh, yeah. put those forward? I'd like, to, I'd like us to move forward. I think yeah. we've, we've talked around the issue quite a bit. The, the, we're getting kind of granular, and I think that's going to be more for discussion for the, the oversight aspect of this as we move the forward. The clerk has my amendments. Okay. Would you please read the amendment into the record? Yes. Um, first action is to amend instruction four to read as follows. Instruct the CAO to propose to the city council within 45 days, the elimination of all non-critical vacant positions as defined in the CAO report. This report should include the number of consultants and contractors that will, need, that will be needed to perform city work as a result of eliminating the proposed non-critical vacant positions. The next following instructions are additional instructions. Seven, instruct the CAO to provide a written report within 45 days and in every financial status report thereafter on attrition rates across all city departments. This report should include, one, a breakdown of positions with high attrition rates and low attrition rates. Two, an analysis of how employment levels are affected by the hiring and promotional freeze and their effects on city services. And three, recommendations for implementing effective retention strategies throughout the city. Eight, instruct the CAO with the assistance of the CLA to provide a written report on the duplication and possible consolidation of services within the city's homeless budget and the city's alternative response services. 
This report should include one, a breakdown of the services that are duplicated across the city and the success metrics associated with each service. Two, an analysis of the potential benefits and challenges associated with consolidating duplicate services. And three, an analysis on how service consolidation may impact the quality of services provided by the city. Nine, instruct the CLA with the assistance of the CAO to report back on sole source contracts related to homelessness initiatives and alternative response initiatives and the possibility of replacing sole source contracted services with city workforce, therefore decreasing the number of vacancy eliminations. 10, CAO to report on the number of department and proprietary department staff that are on loan to other departments and offices. And that's it. Colleagues, any comments, questions on those amendments? Mr. Bacosco. Well, I think this is great. Um, really like the language. I just had two questions. Would the CIO and the CLA on the natural be working with the personnel department? Yes. So we don't have to write them in. I think that makes sense. And I would like to, I can help. I'd like to have this sent uh, also to the personnel committee. Okay. Without objection. Uh, well, thank you. I'm happy to have that. For future report backs, I mean. As an not, additional. Not as a, this language. This I'm language sure. is great. But for future okay. report backs. As, as an additional stuff. instruction, we will put that forward unless Thank somebody you. has an objection. So just a, just, a, just a technical note on that. If if these are reports that are uh, actually, let me, let me, if I could clarify, only um, recommendation number seven was intended to be in the FSR. Is that correct? If it's in the FSR, it would, it would, it would not go to personnel, but it would. Uh, so if, is, is that, is that the intent that only seven goes to, in, is in the FSR? Okay, then the other items, yes. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions? Mr. Astos? No, I, I, um, the, I look, I think uh, I'm very comfortable with uh, seven and eight. I'm very uncomfortable with, uh, I'm, very uncom I'm very comfortable with seven. I'm very uncomfortable with eight and nine. Uh, they focus on homelessness and alternative response, uh, which neither of which are the biggest category of contracting for the city of LA. And, and you know, I'll just put all my cards on the table. Ideologically, I have a hard time with the notion that we hang fiscal problems on the services for poor people only. The biggest contractor in the city of LA is AECOM. The second biggest is Jacobs Engineering. There's never a question about either of them in this council the entire eight years I've been here. And so, again, do we, if we look, if we want to look at contracting, all for it. If we want to only look at contracting for services for people, I'm always a no. But it, okay. so to be clear, uh, we are looking at the contracting in all of these circumstances. That was actually the per much of my conversation because right. I'm concerned about that, mm -hmm. uh, particularly at the expense of our city workforce. So it was actually, I think, predominantly what of uh, much of the concerns that I've raised. But we can't ignore that there's a lot of duplication in contract services with respect to homelessness. That is irrefutable. We've seen it from, uh, and I've talked about it uh, many times in committee, uh, when we look at uh, from outreach to service providers, all of these things, there's not economies of scale. We're not having uh, the most efficient contracting. In fact, uh, when we talked about just in homelessness committee last week, uh, about the costs of the service providers for uh, Inside Safe. Uh, the gentleman, and I don't recall the gentleman's name, but when we, when we discovered that uh, the ceiling was $110 per room, uh, per, room per night, uh, it doubled the cost of the Inside Safe cost. But the gentleman said, uh, and I, I didn't mention it in the moment, but the gentleman said, Oh, but originally we were paying a lot more than that. And so I'm saying this because we really have to have a deep dive and honest conversation about what contract work is being given on with respect to homelessness because we're paying threefold the way I've, I, and I've said this many times, when you look at what the county's doing, when you look at uh, what council offices individually are doing, uh, when you look at what we pay LASA to do, there's a lot of duplication and you know, there's a lot of crossover. So this is all about making sure that we look at all of these positions to the greatest extent. If we can find space for city employees to do this work, 
let's find the space for city employees to do this work. Uh, because I think that's what we're all trying to protect that opportunity to do. But I also want to make sure that we're not being, that we're not paying three times for services that many neighborhoods were just not seeing the results in. I, I think we're, we all probably agree on this. I, maybe the simple solution is just to put some language in, says provide a written report uh, of services within, say, the city's budget, including homeless budget and city alternative response. I'm good with that. that it says the same thing, but that it just shows that we're, 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 look, we're looking at everything, mm -hmm. including this. I'm assuming there's no problem there. It's fine. That makes you comfortable. Let's, let's do that, mm -hmm. and let's, let's get mo <laughs> moving. Yep. Colleagues, okay. Let's. Uh, so we're going to call the roll as amended. Bloomfield, aye. Harris Dawson, yes. McOsker, yes. Rodriguez, aye. Four eyes, and the item has been approved as amended. All right. Whew. Long one, but uh, important. Uh, next, we go to uh, another substantial item. Uh, item There's three. More. Item number three. City Administrative Officer and Chief Legislative Analyst Joint Report relative to the status of the Los Angeles Convention Center Expansion Project. And the Trade, Travel, and Tourism Committee has approved this matter. I'm going to have an amendment to this that maybe we read into the record to start, uh, just to help shape our discussion. Do you have that? Amendment to read in? Mr. Chair, I have a copy of the amendment passed out from your office. Okay. Would you like me to read this into the record? Yes. <laughs> and it's been passed around to everyone I assume go ahead number one authorize the CAO and CLA in consultation with AEG planet plenary conventions Los Angeles to evaluate the cost get cost and schedule including risk exposure and cost sharing of APCLA's public-private partnership proposal using revised APCLA numbers from February 2023 as well as any other relevant updated data or information they may have Report on those findings within 45 days and report on a city-directed project. And after 45 days, to engage the consultant to review the terms discussed by CLA, CAO, and AEG. The evaluation of the P3 proposal should be undertaken transparently and on a collaborative basis between the CAO, CLA, and APCLA, with weekly meetings to occur during the 45-day period among CAO, CLA, CTD, and APCLA. The report should answer the following five questions in relation to the Los Angeles Convention Center expansion P3 project as proposed by APCLA. One, what is the estimated construction price and scope of the project? Two, what is the estimated net annual obligation on the general fund after taking LACC net revenues into account? Provide a range of options for council to consider, including various operating terms of the P3 agreement and payment indexation rates that align with the growth rate in the general fund. Three, can the project be delivered in time for the LA 2028 Olympics Paralympics? Provide a development schedule, including the city decisions and actions required to achieve this. Four, when would the first annual availability payment be required to pay to be paid by the city under the proposed financial structure. What flexibility would the city have to refinance the project or adjust the scope and cost of operating services over the term of the P3 agreement? Five, provide a high level summary of the risks transferred to APCLA and retained by the city under the P3 proposal and compare those risks that the city would retain under a traditional delivery model. Recommendation two, Instruct the CAO with the assistance of the CLA to report within 45 days on potential funding sources and funding structures for debt service and P3 availability payments, in addition to impacts on existing programs and services. Great. 
Thank you. Um, I wanted to just put that out there to start with to try to focus this conversation. It's been a long day, but we want to have a presentation on this. This is a different uh, approach than what, what is coming to us from uh, the committee, from the tra Trade, Travel, and Tourism Committee, where they were suggesting a million dollars to be spent. Uh, and this does not spend that million dollars, but instead puts this process forward, uh, you know, hopefully to get us to a resolution faster. But with that, I want to turn the floor over to you guys so you, for the presentation, but to do it in the context of both what the committee is presenting to us and then also understanding what is being proposed here. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Matt Zabo, uh, City Administrative Officer. So I will, I will briefly introduce the item as represented in the, in the report, and then we can have the conversation about the, the, proposed, uh, the proposed amendments. Um, and then I'll turn it over to the CLA to go through, well, we'll see whether we go through the recommendations or whether we discuss the recommendations as, as you just proposed, whatever you'd prefer. Um, but I will, I'll just start by uh, introducing the item. The, the three, uh, there are three principal questions before the committee today uh, related to the future of the convention center. Number one, uh, sh shall the city proceed with a convention center expansion project? Number two, if so, uh, should the city proceed now or after the 2028 Olympics? And number three, uh, if so, what is the best delivery method for the project, a, a public-private partnership or a more traditional city-managed delivery, delivery model? Um, so to in assist the committee and the council in making this decision, the CLA in my office asked an answer to critical questions. Number one, what would be the extent of the uh, positive economic impact derived from a convention center expansion? And number two, uh, would the additional economic activity uh, generate enough new tax revenue to pay for the expansion? We worked with, uh, with Ernst & Young um, for an economic impact analysis that is in the report. Uh, we project that a convention center expansion project will add significant uh, incremental jobs, labor income, and economic output throughout the city. For the first 30 years of the post-expansion operations, uh, when compared with the status quo, the convention center expansion would add an additional 2,600 uh, incremental jobs, generating approximately $6 billion in additional labor income and more than $15 billion in economic output in nominal dollars. Uh, in addition, the expansion would bring in uh, additional events and additional visitors. These visitors would uh, be expected to increase their spending in the city by an average of $166 million annually, which in addition to operational spending by the convention center uh, would support approximately 6,900 jobs uh, in the city by fiscal 2033. And that's 2100, an increase of 2,100 jobs over the status quo scenario. Uh, but to answer the second question, would the additional economic activity generate enough uh, tax revenue and other revenues to pay for the expansion, uh, that answer is a resounding no. Uh, the, the expansion project is estimated to cost between uh, 4.8 and $6.5 billion over 30 years when you include construction, operations, and maintenance. And even after accounting for additional revenue to the convention center derived from additional events and digital signage and parking, and additional tax revenue to the general fund uh, related to the enhanced economic, economic activity and spending, the project would cost the general fund between $1.4 and $3.1 billion uh, over that same 30-year period. That is an average of $48 million, uh, of a range between $48 million and $103 million on average per year, every year for 30 years. Uh, and the general fund cost, by the way, would be front-loaded as, as revenues would ramp up over time. Um, I will stop there with the initial framing, and then at your discretion, Mr. Chair, if you'd like the CLA to go through the recommendations or if you would prefer that we discuss the proposed amendment. 
Good. I said, do you want to add to that? Um, yes, I can just add to that. So in our original report that was presented to the, to the Trade, uh, Travel, and Tourism Committee, uh, there was four uh, options uh, for the committee to choose from as it relates to how to proceed. Um, we had originally sought additional direction from council. We had been discussing convention center expansion for a decade and a half. Uh, but obviously the world has changed as it relates to the convention center business as well as other competing interests for general fund monies. And so that was the purpose of us bringing the report back to present options for the committee to consider. When trade, travel, and tourism heard the uh, our recommendations, um, they kind of took uh, uh, two of them and kind of combined them. But basically uh, the first option was to continue our work with the joint uh, P3 adventure with APCLA to continue working with them uh, to come back with a proposal to, that would meet certain parameters and was related to the uh, project itself to also to have the uh, hotel development that was uh, contemplated um, and also a number of things as it related to cost sharing and cost risks um, and that if those things didn't happen that we would be able to terminate. The second option was for us to explore a city-driven project um, and also to report back to you on the costs that would re be related to um, funding that over the long term. The third option was to uh, have um, the city council consider uh, structuring an, an expansion sometime after the Olympics and that was to allow for a more thoughtful process and maybe to actually consider changing uh, the type of expansion that would occur. And of course the final option, which was the most cost beneficial, but obviously not what everybody wanted to do. We all believe a convention center expansion and renovation is very necessary. The fourth option was really just to do um, uh, regular maintenance. So what the Trade, Travel, and Tourism Committee uh, did was to instruct uh, our offices to continue working toward the, the project that was originally designed to expand up to a million dollars uh, for analysis of the scheduling as well as further uh, design considerations and see whether the project can actually be delivered in time for the Olympics. Um, Mr. Chair, the recommendations that you've put forward the way we understand them is, is that you want us to continue exploring that, but not to expend the funding, the million dollars, but to continue looking uh, at the, the expansion, having the review of the analysis to meet with APCLA, to continue look, evaluating the um, city-driven project, and then to have our consultants review those cost analyses and to come back to you and also answering the five fundamental questions that you have put forward uh, in your amendment. So it is slightly different than what TTT uh, recommended, but that is our understanding of your recommendations here. And, and the key part is working, working with the, uh, what the AEG folks over these next 45 days so that we make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of the questions that we're answering, which we, we laid out these five. Because the concern is we spend a million dollars on, on answering questions and then they're not the right questions that we've all agreed to. So, so part of it is to, to really narrow that down and work with them over the next 45 days uh, to review that proposal. Mikowski. Thank you. Two things. Um, I just want to go down the path of the million dollars and, and how we can spend that in 45 days. And the other, I was going to ask Mr. Chair if we could ha ask the plenary group to come up and, and answer a few questions. Sure. So, happy, to, happy to include that. While well, plenary group is coming up, I just want to ask about the million bucks. Um, and I sit on Triple T, uh, but it was weeks ago. It was many weeks ago, several, I should say. Um, that a million dollars didn't seem as much money as it seems today. In the context of this meeting, it seems like a lot more money. And so I don't know what the rates are, uh, but at a, a million dollar a burn rate of $500 an hour, that's a lot of work. That's over 45 days. That's probably 40 or 50 hours a day of work, seven days a week. Is that really what we're expecting to be able to spend in 45 days? And can we save some of that money? Well, Ben's the health CEO. Just to be clear, the, the 
the scope of work that was contemplated for that million dollars from the Triple T committee is slightly different from what's being requested now, from what's being asked for now. You so, mean now is more focused and less? Well, it's, I wouldn't necessarily say it's less because from, from the CO standpoint, and I would argue the CLA and the city standpoint altogether, we still need experts with us, experts that have done P3s in the past that have been engaged and, and know the P3 environment. We're not P3 experts here at all. So we need that expertise alongside these weekly, if we're gonna have, be having weekly meetings, so that you know we, we get a, a, you know, a you know unbiased opinion as to the information that we're receiving at these meetings from from the uh, APCLA is is in fact uh, you know valid and so we would still I would say argue that we would still need some level of funding to, to continue to engage with uh, our consultants at the least um, during this time frame Will the consultant be uh, hourly rate or are we talking about a flat rate um, no, I'm not 100% sure on the structure of the contract. I, I think it's, it's based on uh, deliverables, so um, we would have to engage with them to figure out what that, what that amount and rate would be. And Mr. McCosker, the consultant would be for our benefit, the city's benefit. Right, right. So that, uh, that was the purpose of the, the additional costs. It was to uh, evaluate uh, what was being presented by APCLA, so they were for our benefit. And just to add, the, the scope of work, again, that we were contemplating in Triple T included additional um, you know, work on the consultants we have with regard to cost estimation and schedule work, mm -hmm. which, you know, given, uh, I think, this direction wouldn't necessarily come in place until after that 45-day period. So there would be some, some cost savings, if you will, by not doing that work right off the bat, uh, but then eventually we would probably have to engage in that work as well. So we, so. but, but we'd gauge in that work, but we would actually have a clearer direction of what, the, what, what it is we're asking them to do. Thank you. Could, um, could Plenary, uh, Representative Plenary, come on up? <coughs> Identify yourself. Yeah, my name's Stuart Marks. I'm with uh, Plenary, and <coughs> we're part of the APCLA joint venture with AEG. Have you had a chance to, are you, are you familiar with the amendment and the focus of this, of this proposal? Yes. Can you give us a, um, a, knowing that we are at arm's length with one another, because my team is sitting to your right, yeah. uh, can you give us a sense of what this work product is and whether it's, a, whether it's achievable? Yes. I think the, one of the key elements that we saw in the proposed amendments there was to uh, use the numbers that APCLA had provided back in February 2023, um, updated to reflect additional information and any updates. Obviously, there's been construction cost escalation, there's been a new building code that's taken effect, interest rates have changed, so those things would need to be updated. But one thing that we saw in the CLA, CAO's report in December of last year was a, um, a statement that they didn't use the February 2023 numbers um, and they provided some reasons for that decision. Uh, so that, one, that was one of the main things that we were seeing here was to use the most updated numbers on the P3 um, and to engage in a more collaborative and transparent process so that we're comparing apples for apples and presenting the numbers that, uh, that, that we've provided and we're aligned on what those numbers are. Would you, I w it would be a reasonable expectation that you would your group would have an internal analysis of what you think the numbers are today. Do you have that? Uh, we've already started updating the February 2023 numbers specifically for construction cost escalation over the 12 months. As I mentioned, there's been a new California building code that's been introduced. We've started uh, uh, quantifying and the, the impacts associated with that. And then we've also uh, updated um, the interest rates and have actually worked on an innovative new financial structure that we think delivers even more additional benefits, um, as well as substantiating the 20% uh, uh, cost reduction in the estimated operations and maintenance costs, which was really the only 
uh, material change in the assumptions that we provided in February 2023. And it was in direct response to a, a request both from the city and their advisors over the period that we were working together to reduce those numbers. So we feel like we've answered and delivered everything that the city's asked us for and just want an opportunity to, to validate that. So you understand that while that would be appreciated, you would be pushing that across the table and then our consultant and our team would be analyzing that to make sure it's real. Yes. We'd be tearing, tearing it apart and looking behind it and deduping it and all those things, right? Absolutely. So, but yep. you'd be ready for that? I mean, because 45 days is a pretty tight timetable and we wouldn't, be, we wouldn't be in a position to be waiting around for you guys to update your numbers before we give them to our consultant. Yep, we've already started that process and in the February 2023 proposal that we submitted, we also, and that was part of the response that we provided in December of last year, there was a seven page summary of all the assumptions that we had updated in February 2023, together with commentary and rationale on the, the, the background of those changes. So we feel like we're in a good starting position to do that, as well as I mentioned, we've already started on uh, updating the ones that do need to be updated. Not all of them do. Thank you. Okay, any additional questions, colleagues? Okay, well then I think we, we uh, I mean, there's a lot of questions on this overall, but uh, it's been talked a lot about in T Committee. I, I'm comfortable moving forward as amended and would recommend that. And uh, Ms. Rodriguez is not here. So we'll, we'll be back in a moment. So while she's coming back, I guess I'll, uh, you know, any comments about waiting until after 2028 Olympics? Pro, con? I think there are benefits to that, but if you want to go into that discussion. I, I actually do have a question on that. Yes. Thank you. So if we were to wait and mm -hmm. say, no, we're going to wait till after the 2028 Olympics, I would imagine uh, our our costs are not zero. Would we have we would we have maintenance and repair and upgrade yes. costs Absolutely. on the natural? Absolutely. Do we know what those numbers would be? We could determine and present that to you. But one thing with waiting, so what we're doing now is we're focused on a particular project right yeah. now, yeah. right? So this particular project that we've been discussing for the past five or six years or seven years now, yeah. it's, it's, it's structured a certain way, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, it, it's a certain amount of expansion, it's a certain amount of convention center uh, meeting space, it's a connection that connects the buildings over Pico. Um, yeah. It's yeah. a very specific project. If you were, if you were to decide to uh, build later, you could have a more thoughtful process on ways other ways that the expansion could take place. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, it may not be a connection over Pico. The buildings are very different now. They're very, they're older now. You yeah. may decide that, you know, we may need to tear down the West Hall, for example, and maybe then costs could be minimized because then you have a blank slate as opposed to trying to connect buildings. So there are different ways of sure. looking at it. Um, but I yes. was kind of getting at if we were going to not do the expansion, if that became the option, there, and maybe, maybe the Mr. Liu can answer this. Are there <coughs> sort of costs? Is there deferred maintenance and things that we would have to do just to to um, continue on with the with the the footprint that we have now? Is, is there money that we'd be putting in over the years until we get to 2028? Yeah, we call this the uh, lipstick on a pig option. Option four. It, it's not free. It doesn't. It's it's not. Doing nothing is not going to cost zero dollars. We've got, as a CLA, or CAO knows, uh, over $111 million worth of deferred maintenance in our CIP requests that we've just been carrying over every year. So there's just that in you know fixing leaks. And um, we've got uh, uh, seismic retrofitting that we've delayed because we thought we were going to do the expansion. And so that was built into the expansion and modernization project. So there's right. probably at least $50 million worth of uh, seismic retrofits. Probably have to demolish one of the parking garages and rebuild it because of the seismic retrofitting. At a minimum, we would need to do paint and, and carpeting and just cosmetic things to, to host events, including the Olympics. Um, and I would propose that we would still want to do the Gil Lindsay Plaza uh, 
modernization. So I would say we're looking at over $300 million to do nothing. Thank you. I'm, I wouldn't propose that we ask for that analysis in 45 days, but that, that is helpful. I'm, I'm prepared to move forward on the amendment. Okay, great. And some of my questions are going to be answered by the amendment. You know, like we, we've had different, uh, I've heard different things about what, when our payments actually start. Uh, and we don't have to answer this now, because, but, you know, some folks are saying it won't start for a few years. And then I also heard directly that we know we're going to have initial design for 60, 70 million up front. Those are real questions, but those are questions that are incorporated in the questions we're going to get answered if we move forward with it. So I'm not going to ask you that now, uh, but just a little teaser for some of the, the fun things that are, we're going to learn in these 45 days. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, with that, uh, the amendments have been uh, been moved. So let's uh, let's open the roll for this item uh, as amended. Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. McOsker. Yes. Rodriguez. Aye. Three ayes, and the item has been approved as amended. Great. Thank you. We confirm that that clears the decks for the uh, open session, right? That's correct. Sir. Thank you. I, I wanted to just defer the other ones, but I'm told that we have time limits, so we're going to have to do, we have a couple of, of closed session items that we're going to have to go through, hopefully relatively quickly, although some of them are, are big dollars, but we'll, we'll move as quick as we can. So if we could clear the room and prepare for closed session. Thank you, everybody who was here for uh, these big items that we had today. Uh, and hopefully we have some. Mr. Chair, we are now in open session. There is nothing to report from closed session. Would you like to adjourn the meeting? Yeah.